Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for attending this meeting of the Council. Please note that the meeting is being live streamed on the Council's YouTube channel. I welcome members of the press and public who may be viewing this meeting remotely. We now move on to the formal business of the meeting. Can we take the notice convening the meeting as read? Do we have any apologies of absence? Yes, Madam Mayor, we have apologies from councillors Eyre, Dunn, McKeith, Nicholson and Reid and also Honorary Alderman Tate. Are there any further apologies? Thank you. Just um, Julia Potts and Kieran Morrissey will be attending but are running late. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Martin Heron as well, please. The next item is the minutes of the meeting of the Council held on the 28th of February, 2024. Can we agree the minutes? Madam Mayor, a uh, point of order, please. I wish to move Two motions without notice under part four, section 113B, in relation to the accuracy of the minutes, and part four, section 13D, to refer someone to an appropriate body or individual. As they both relate to the same matter, Madam Mayor, it may be best if you consider taking them both together, which my group are happy to do. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Uh, if it's agreed, I'll uh, introduce the motion and speak in it. Thank you. Madam Mayor, could I second that motion, please? And speak immediately after the mover. Can you just give me a moment, please? Thank you. Leader, could you explain what it is, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the minutes of the meeting held on the Feb Wednesday the 28th of February do not accurately reflect uh, what was said and done during the meeting as they do not show the lie told by Councillor Lyle Reid when he told Council that Marks and Spencers had written him a letter to say that it had withdrawn from the city centre due to three after three parking being scrapped. This is not the case and it was pointed out to him at the meeting. Furthermore, Madam Mayor, this council will refer Councillor Reid to the Standards Committee for bringing the council into disrepute by deliberately misleading both council and the residents of the city. So that is why I'm bringing a notice of motion in this way, Madam Mayor, as an emergency action. Thank you, Leader. Just give me a moment.
I'm ruling the motions invalid. The reasons are, members will be aware that council minutes are in a formal style, which does not record the context of speeches. Not recording a statement made by a member does not therefore relate to the accuracy of the minutes. Under the council procedure rules, the only part of the minutes that can be discussed is their accuracy. On the other point, if you wish to complain about a councillor, a complaint should be made to a standards committee by a councillor, not the council as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, disappointed, but we will be referring Councillor Reid to the Standards Committee if that's our only option. Thank you. Madam Mayor, uh, at this point it might be appropriate. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I have a point of order as well, Madam Mayor. Uh, it's in relation to the uh, agenda under Part 4, Section 1. 13C to change the order of the business of the agenda. Madam Mayor. Can we just agree the minutes first, Councillor okay, Stewart? First. Sorry. Yep. Madam Mayor, can I make a point of order, please? I don't believe the minutes are accurate because it doesn't state why uh, the Conservative motion uh, was amended and part of it was uh, disqualified under your ruling. I think it's important that it is reflected that this insidious uh, referendum is causing pain and harm to individuals and actually on a personal note has caused two phone calls to me where death threats were given and I quote one of them stated that I should be lined up with them and shot. This is should be reflected uh, that the Conservatives is no more than a far right party what is espousing hatred towards individuals what are fleeing persecution. Thank you, Councillor O'Brien, but that is the same point of order as before. My decision still stands. Thank you. Can we now agree the minutes? Do any members have any interest to declare? Councillor Dixon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it's basically been a member of the Planning and Highways Committee and uh, looking at the notes of motion, uh, short-term rest by care in Sunderland. Um, this is likely to come to the Planning and Highways Committee in the future. So I would like to keep a clear division between the debate at this meeting and the next one and request that I uh, leave the council chamber when it's been discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, councillor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, mine's on item 13, motion three, uh, hot food takeaways. Again, being on planning, I've sought advice from the solicitor and I'm going to step out for that debate if that's all right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just an advisory declaration on the hot food takeaways. A uh, motion, it does refer to pubs, and my employer is the Campaign for Real Ale, which wants to see thriving pubs in every community. Um, I've sought advice from the city solicitor who says I can stay in the room because none of the recommendations relate to pubs, but just to put that on the record. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Peacock. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, in the same vein as Councillor Dixon, uh, our position on the planning committee relating to the short-term respite care uh, I'll be stepping out as well. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Exactly the same as Councillor Peacock and Councillor Dixon. Thank you. Yes, Councillor. Thank you, Mayor. Sunderland. Can you same please stand as, uh, up? Thank, thank you. Mayor Sunderland. Same as Martin Haswell. I'll be stepping out as I'm on the planning committee um, and I don't want there to be any sort of conflict. Thank you. Mm. Councillor Warren. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I should Councillor Wong, well. can you please stand up? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll have to declare an interest as well because I sit on planning. <laughs> Thank you.
Sorry, Councillor Curtis. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm on planning as well, and I'm on, also on children's scrutiny, so I'll have to step out as well. This is Councillor Foster. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'm Vice Chair Planning, so I'm in the same. I'll have to declare. Madam Mayor, if I can just clarify um, for members through you, members who um, sit on the planning committee may wish to declare an interest. It is up to each individual member to decide how they want to approach um, the consideration of the relevant motion. What's most important is that if they are sitting on planning and highways committee and there's an application for a hot food takeaway before them or if they're considering the application in respect of Red Gables, they may wish to make a declaration of the Planning and Highways Committee that they will consider the application with an open mind, regardless of anything they may have said in the council meeting, in the debate on, on those motions. Um, I would advise any member who wishes to remain in the room while debating the motion that they may wish to just exercise caution, that anything that they say in respect of the motion might not give the indication that they have a closed mind when they're considering any future planning applications, but it is very much a matter for the individual member how they wish to proceed. They're not required to leave the room, but if they feel more comfortable keeping that separation between the two roles, then that is their decision. That's absolutely fine. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Chai. Yeah, point of order, please. I, I'm, I'm a bit confused by the by the City Solicitor's statement there in relation to planning matters. I refer you to the Constitution, Part 4, Section 1, Scope 12.3. The Chief Executive may reject the motion on the following grounds that it, C, refers to applications for or objections to planning permissions or any licence, notice or order itself issued, served or made by the Council. So if this is in relation to a plan application, how is it not being rejected, Madam Mayor? Madam Mayor, through you, the motion does not refer to a specific... It's not asking Council to make a decision on a particular planning application. Um, it's, it's talking about hot food takeaways in general, and the matter in respect of Red Gables is directed more to the service provision rather than the planning application. So on that basis, I would suggest that the, that the motions are valid and it's really a matter for any member who will be considering a planning application in respect of those areas to ensure that they do consider them with an open mind. And if they are considering such applications, they may wish to state at the relevant meeting that they'll consider them with an open mind. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to thank those members who have given notice of their wish to speak. Where notice has been given, the member will be invited to speak at the appropriate time. If any member who hasn't given prior notice wishes to speak at any point during the meeting, they should please raise their hand to indicate and speak when invited to do so. It would also be of assistance if they could state their name. Members will appreciate that we have a very full agenda this afternoon. And I would therefore remind everyone that under this Council's rules of procedure, speeches must be directed to the question under discussion or to a personal explanation or point of order. Madam Mayor, uh, can I bring a point of order in at this that point? Stand up. Sorry, Madam Mayor. Just in relation to... Councillor Stewart, just give us a second, please. Thank you. I might get there at the end. Can we just get to the end of this little bit and then I will bring you in, Councillor Stewart. Thank you. In addition, no speech may exceed five minutes without my consent. To enable Council to transact as much of its business as possible in the time available, I'm minded not to grant extensions to speeches routinely and would ask members to make every effort to conclude their speeches in the five minutes allowed. Madam Mayor. 
Third, third time lucky. There we are. Um, sorry, it's uh, part four, section one, 13C, to change the order of the business in the agenda. And it's raising the, the very point that you've made there with regards to the, the, uh, the full agenda. What I would propose is that item six to be moved down the council agenda and to follow after the current item 12 to ensure that the business of the council is concluded tonight. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll second that, Madam Mayor. Do we all agree? No. Do we need to go to the vote? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. So if the officer could start the vote running, please, and ring the division bell, please. So the vote is running now, members. So, members, the vote will be closing now. <laughs> there are 57 votes in favour, no abstentions, and 10 votes against. So... The motion is carried and the order of business is varied. Thank you. As the municipal elections in May approach, there are two of our colleagues who have indicated that they will be retiring at the end of their current terms of office. As this will be their last council meeting, I would therefore like to pay tribute to these members. If anyone would like to make a comment, or if anyone of the retiring councillors wish to respond and address the council, I will offer an opportunity at the end of this announcement. Starting with the longest serving member, Councillor Pat Smith. Pat was elected to the council in May 1999 as a member for the Selfsworth Ward and has continued to serve that ward to this day. Having a keen interest in children's services, learning and skills, Pat served as a member of the Education Subcommittee from 1999 to 2002, before becoming a member of Cabinet, where she held the various portfolios for education and children's services from, 20, from 2002 until 2016. Pat was also actively involved in this council's scrutiny function, serving as chairman of the Children, Education and Skills Scrutiny Committee from 2016 until 2023, and also as a current member of the Scrutiny Coordinating Committee. Over the years, Pat has served on many committees and outside bodies, too numerous to mention. But key examples include the East and West Sunderland Area Committees, Planning and Highways Committee, Human Resources Committee, Corporate Parenting Board, Sunderland Health and Wellbeing Board, Sunderland University Board of Governors, Sunderland AFC Foundation Board, Sunderland Adults Partnership Board and the Children's Trust. On to Councillor Colin Nicholson. Councillor Colin Nicholson was elected to the Council in May 2021, serving the Pallion Ward firstly as a Liberal Democrat Councillor until August 2023, and laterally as an Independent. 
Colin currently serves as a member of the West Sunderland Area Committee and, was, and has previously served on the Planning and Highways Committee, the Audit and Governance Committee, the Homelessness, Homelessness Appeals Panel, and the Education Complaints Panel. Can I wish Councillors Smith and Nicholson a happy retirement from the Council and thank them for their contribution? Councillor Smith, I understand you would like to respond. Thank you. I just first of all, and I'm going to be quick because there's something else I want to mention. I'd like to thank all the councillors, both past and present, all the officers, past and present, the partners, the voluntary sector in Sunderland that helped this council. And as you said, I've been on many boards, the college, the university, Gentoo, and everyone, and I've always had a big, good reception for this council on those bodies. I'd also like to thank the residents that have put me here and the Labour Party that put me here. I'd like to thank my ward colleagues because I had two donking ward colleagues in the late John Donnelly and the ever-present Peter Gibson. Um, and that was a hard trial, but it certainly learned you the business of the council and my present uh, ward colleagues. More importantly, what I'd like to mention is Derwent Hill. Derwent Hill is something that this council has in its midst that is the, the wish of, it would be the wish of every other local authority if they were able. We've had this facility for our children and young people from 1962, and it's down to the past councillors and the past officers of this council that it's gone forward, it's developed, and it's had thousands of our young people through its doors. This council should be massively proud of that. What I would like to say to you all here, and it's down to you all now, because it's in your gift now, you are here, you've got to look after it. And I'm sure there'll be many eyes that'll keep an eye on everyone to make sure they do. Matt Ellis and his team at Derwent Hill, who do a great job, would love to see you if you're ever up there in the Lake District, in that little piece of heaven that our children go to. And it gives them marvellous aspirations, and our schools praise it all of the time. Please take care and look after it. And when the budget comes around each year, read your report and make sure it is getting looked after, which I'm sure it will be. I would just like to wish you all the very best. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Do any other members wish to speak? Would you please indicate? Madam Mayor, Councillor Curtis had given prior indication. Um, it's also the leader, deputy leader, Councillor Ty, and Councillor Mullen had also given prior indication. So, Madam Mayor, that's Councillors Curtis, the leader, deputy leader, Ty, and Mullen. Councillor Curtis. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I would just like to speak on behalf of um, Councillor Colin Nicholson. Um, but before I do that, I would like to thank Councillor Pat Smith for all the help and support she's given me. Um, it's been really appreciated. And she's given me some good advice on how to deal with certain situations. So thank you, um, Pat. Um, as regards to Councillor Nicholson, well, um, I've known Councillor Nicholson since he was elected. Um, he's a brilliant gentleman and scholar. He's always thought very highly of everybody in this chamber. It doesn't matter what side of the chamber you sit on, and he does not dislike anyone. And what a few things that I will remember him for is he was one of the leading councillors who actually set up the... Um, the negotiations and talks with Crown Works for um, Pollywood, as we will call it. Um, I, I was actually in one of the meetings, which was, um, it was asked to organise by the officers, 
um, way back in the beginning. And um, he was very pro the idea after, uh, uh, definitely after listening to it. So I want him to be like thought of as that as well. And um, on a personal note, he's from the Manchester area and um, normally somebody like me wouldn't get on with anybody like that because I'm a big Liverpool supporter and don't even start Councillor Miller. We, we had this conversation on Sunday after Liverpool lost against Man United. But, um, yeah, he's become a very good friend of mine, not just a colleague. So I, I want to wish him all the best on behalf of myself and Councillor George Smith as well, who's actually worked with him. And I look forward to seeing what he's got in the future. So thank you, Councillor Colin Nicholson. Thank you, Mayor. Nita. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I've known, I've known Pat as a councillor since 2006 when I uh, became a councillor, so uh, it's getting on for uh, 18 years. Uh, I came on the council along with Councillor Ty, who came in at the same time as new councillor, and Pat was very helpful. Over the years, uh, I've had the pleasure of sitting on the same cabinet with her. She was Children's Services. I was housing, regen and adult social care uh, for the previous leader, councillor Paul Watson, and we shared that table with a lot of other people for six years. But within the group, she's the Labour Group Vice Chair. And I think a lot of people will miss Pat's uh, warmth or ability. She's a very good ear and she gives good advice. So I want to thank her for having been a very warm colleague to me uh, hopefully, you know, as friends, we'll continue post being a councillor. And uh, I wish her all the, way, uh, all the best for the future, given she's had a couple of oh, no, poor last years. And uh, well, she'll be sadly missed, Madam Mayor. So good luck, Pat, going forward. Deputy Leader. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. I would very much like to thank um, Councillor Smith for her service to this council, but despite me pleas otherwise, she remains insistent that she's going to retire this year, and believe us, I've tried to convince her to stay. But on a personal note, I would like to say that Councillor, thank Councillor Smith for her much appreciated support since I first became elected, and in particular, making us feel welcome on the children's scrutiny, and I learned much from Pat in... Um, chairing meetings because I'm still yet to come across anybody that holds quite the command and respect that Councillor Smith does from across the chamber and otherwise. Councillor Smith for me has been a source of wisdom, knowledge, humour and advice and I have learned a great deal from Councillor Smith and she will be sorely missed by not just myself but also my colleagues. Thank you Madam Mayor. Councillor Ty. Thanks, Madam Mayor. I'm not going to take too much of the time, but I, I couldn't not say a few words about Pat on behalf of the residents of Silksworth and on behalf of the, the Labour Group. As, as the leader's already alluded, Pat is the vice chair of the Labour Group, and all of those that sit around on this side of the chamber know why she's the vice chair of the Labour Group, and that's to, complete, to keep me in check and keep me in order, and it's the only way I'm always allowed to be there the chair of the Labour Group by having Pat with that ability. But joking aside, I think something that Pat frequently talks about as well, and, and, and you look around the chamber, there is a lot of new faces on, on, on council as a predominantly young Labour Group that, we're, that we've got coming through and on. Pat's always sticking to those like glue and, and helping them, and she does have concerns. And, and one of the reasons why we've tried to keep Pat on in fairness is that as the experience goes, it's really, really difficult. And, and those new councillors that's on, and you see some of the behaviour from the likes of Councillor Hart, and that, that, that is not normal behaviour. And, and Pat is one of the advocates that always say, that's not how we should behave. A council should be respectful. We should treat the residents with respect. And we should do everything with respect. And the residents of Silksworth have certainly thanked Pat for that. 
So again, on behalf of the Silksworth councillors, I want to say thanks very much to Pat for everything that she's done. She is sincere through and through, as we all know. There's never, ever a hidden agenda. She'll tell you as she as it is, how it should be, but she does that with the ultimate of respect and she has to be absolutely commended for that. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Councillor Mullen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, on behalf of my group, I just want to wish both retirees the best for the future and, and to agree with the comments that have been made about losing experience. Um, Pat, I'm, I'm sorry I talk so much in scrutiny. I, I know. I know sometimes it, it, it's irritating, but I think also your contributions to those meetings have been um, hugely influential on the, um, the scrutiny coordinating committee as well. And that's the kind of experience that will be missed in future. Uh, it's a shame that Colin Nicholson's not here because I, I like Colin enormously. I think with his various political persuasions, he's offered something to everyone. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was going to remind him that tomorrow night is the Barnes Residents Association meeting. I, I'll offer that as an open invite to everyone if you live in the ward, but Colin still does, and I'm sure he will continue to be an active resident, and I will miss him as well. The next item is recep reception of petitions. Do any members have any petitions to present? Councillor Donaghy, Councillor Hodson, Hodson, and Councillor Haswell. Councillor Haswell. Councillor Donaghy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This petition is from the residents of Donwell and the wider Washington area, mainly Donwell Road. We, the undersigned residents of Donwell, are opposed to council and private companies buying up houses in our area and turning them into HMOs. We were never consulted on this, and residents have genuine safety and security issues. This is a family area, and we in fully intend to fight this. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Hodson. Yes, thank you, Mayor Sunderland. Um, I have a petition uh, to Sunderland City Council to save free after three parking. Uh, it reads, we, the undersigned, call on Sunderland City Council to reverse its plan to cut free after three parking in Sunderland Council car parks. Thank you. Councillor Haswell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Apologies, I have three. Um, first of all is for the Terminus Bus Shelter. So I, we, the undersigned, call on Nexus and Sunderland City Council to fund the installation of a new bus shelter at the Terminus near the junction of Phoenix Road and St Luke's Road. The second one is regarding the uh, St Luke's Road, Front Road, Westmore Road, European Way roundabout. It's a busy one. I, we, the undersigned, call on Sunderland City Council to carry out a review of the St Luke's Road, Front Road, Westmoor Road, European Way roundabouts and present plans to change the layout and make them safer for drivers and pedestrians. And finally, Pennywell Pavement Repairs Petition. I, we, the undersigned, call on Sunderland City Council to repair the pavements on Prestwick Road, Petersham Road, Portrush Road and Paulbrook Road, which have been identified as being in need of repair. Thank you. Thank you. Can we, refer to, can we agree to refer these to the appropriate Chief Officer? The next item is questions from the public. I will now read out the questions we have received. <clears throat> Elizabeth Brown. A resident of Sunderland has submitted the following question. What is the council doing about ASB in Concord, Albany and the surrounding areas? Motorbikes and cars robbing shops, wearing balaclavas so they can't be identified. When are Washington going to get a police presence to combat this? And I believe Deputy Leader, um, thank you, Madam Mayor, and I would like to thank Elizabeth Brown um, for her question. The Council encourages residents to report incidents of antisocial behaviour to allow appropriate investigations to be undertaken. The Council work in partnership with Northumbria Police as part of a recently formed motorbike disorder unit to specifically tac tackle vehicle crimes. 
The aim of the team is to use an intelligence-led target approach to deal with quad, scooter, motorbike disorder and reduce opportunities for this antisocial behaviour. Concord, Albany and the surrounding areas of Washington are included in this targeted action. Since its creation in December 2023, over 250 proactive patrols have been undertaken across the city with 15 civil orders being served, 30 vehicles seized and 15 arrests made. The team work with other agencies to disrupt criminal and antisocial use of motorbikes across the city, challenging tenancies, assisting in the identification of individuals and carrying out referrals to deter bad behaviour, which will, in combination, improve the situation. Northumbria Police determined the most appropriate resourcing for police presence and building assets within the city. They are, at the, appropriate aid, they are the appropriate agency to deal with crimes such as to robbery. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Next question is from Deborah Newton, resident of Sunderland. And again, I believe the deputy leader will be replying to this. Can the council please take a look at the location Tunstall Hill Nature Reserve? It has been destroyed due to scrambler bikes and quad bikes racing across the fields. It's looking like a ploughed field. Accident waiting to happen where people walk with children and dogs. Can I suggest placing some of the large boulders along the edges of the grassed areas to at least try to reduce access to the fields by bikers and let nature restore the damage that has been caused? Deputy Leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. A motorbike dis I would like to thank Deborah Newton for our question. A motorbike disorder unit has been set up as a joint project between Northumbria Police and the council to challenge antisocial behaviour, specifically in relation to scooter, quad and motorbike crime. Since its creation in December 23, uh, uh, same statistics as before, Madam Mayor, 15 civil orders being served, 30 vehicles seized and 15 arrests being made across the city. The council links with partner agents to challenge tenancies and their to challenge these tenancies, assisting in the identification of individuals to help prove the situation. Whilst there is no record of any reported incidents in this particular area, the team will, going forward, include Tunstall Hill Nature Reserve in the areas for specific action and consideration of potential physical control measures to design out crime. And I've been made aware that this is something that the ward councillors um, have taken action on in terms of the boulders. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. The next question is from Andy Stafford, a resident of Sunderland, and I believe Councillor Price will be replying to this. Following the success of the Seaburn Seafront regeneration, are there any planned or future events that will attract even more visitors to the area and the wider city? Councillor Price. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Mr Stafford, for his question. I'm sure everyone in this chamber today are rightly proud of our twin resorts and our beautiful seafront, a true jewel in the crown. Of course, we're delighted to witness the new cafe culture and confidence shown in this area. And following this successful Seabird and Roker seafront regeneration, there are a number of events scheduled for the summer of 2024, including the peer-to-peer -peer run, utilising both the beach and coastal pathways, a classic car show and Armed Forces Day celebration and the very popular Summer Streets Festival, which is held over a full two days. There's a number of other shows booked in throughout this summer season. And the council actively marketed the seafront to event organisers, large and small, drawing attention to the beautiful natural asset the area provides. The range of local food outlets now complements our programme and we welcome anyone coming down to the seafront to use our facilities and to complement the wider city events and cultural programme. Thank you. And the next question is from Stephanie Pickering, a resident of Sunderland, and I believe Councillor Stewart will be replying to this. 
It has been proposed that Sunderland Council give members of staff earning less than £50,000 per year an extra day's leave. This is likely to cost the Council an extra £266,000 per year from a Freedom of Information. Why, when the Council is stating they must reduce costs, do they believe this is acceptable to the public when members of staff with less than five years service already receive 26 <coughs> days holiday plus all bank holidays and those with over five years service receive 31 days holiday plus all bank holidays. Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and I'd like to, to, to thank Stephanie for uh, the question and um, actually looking forward to, 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 to answering it. But uh, in, make the first point in, with regard to the number of days that she references, that Stephanie references in the um, um, in a question. It'll be interesting to, just to, just to compare that to a very large manufacturer within the, the city of Sunderland, and I won't embarrass them, but uh, they build cars. But uh, the, the number of holidays uh, within that organisation is very much comparable with regards to. to uh, what uh, our council employees get. And indeed, uh, if you do your research, another very large supermarket chain uh, also have, uh, if you include um, ho uh, bank holidays, um, uh, 39 days um, leave. So again, comparable with regards to, to what we have with our uh, local government workforce. But... Um, in re with regards to, to, to the, the, the reason, I'm very happy to remind Stephanie of the rationale of the decision of the full council back in November 2023 to award our staff an additional day's annual leave. The rationale goes back to the time most of us will not forget of the COVID pandemic and the three lockdowns instigated by the government in their attempts to limit the number of deaths, which is currently approaching 200,000 people, uh, Madam Mayor. During the pandemic, while many of us were in lockdown at home, essential key functions in society kept going, whether that be our nurses and doctors keeping the NHS going, retail workers keeping our supermarkets open, those working in en the energy sector literally keeping the lights on, and of course, staff working in local government ensuring that key local public services were open for people like me and like you, Stephanie. I'm sure that you, like many of us, clapped each week and thanked and appreciated all those who went that extra mile, but the motion in November was clear that we needed to do more to make a small gesture to our workers, a permanent gesture to say a thank you to our workforce. At a time where workers across the UK are under a great deal of pressure with rising household expenses, work-related stress and personal commitments, it's more important than ever that people take time off to rest and recharge so that they can come back stronger. It is therefore no surprise that the motion had full cross-party support, Stephanie, both Labour, Conservative, Lib, De Lib Dem and even Reform all voted to support the provision of an additional day's leave and they all thought it was the right thing to do. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Next question is from Brandon Feely, a resident of Sunderland, and I believe Councillor Johnson will answer this. Can you please provide an update on the condition of the road surface on Bourne Mill Lane, Rickleton? Councillor John. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to thank Brandon for the question. I can confirm that the highway officers have inspected the road surface on Bourne Mill Lane and found it to be in a safe condition. However, there are two sections in need of attention which are included for resurfacing in the 2024 to 2025 Highway and Maintenance Programme. The remaining sections of the road will be monitored through regular inspections and should there be any actionable defects observed, the necessary repairs will be undertaken. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And the next question is from Dennis Carroll, a resident of Sunderland, and I believe the Deputy Leader will answer this. In the Sandhill Ward, there is a problem with dog faeces on pavements, footpaths, etc. Goole Road alongside the park is particularly bad. Basically, this is antisocial behaviour. 
Across the city, what enforcement action is the Council taking? How many fixed penalty notices have been issued in the past 12 months? How many prosecutions have there been in the last two years? Is it not time to proactively enforce the law and prosecute offenders? Deputy Leader. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor, and I would like to thank Dennis Carroll for the question. The Council has a team of neighbourhood wardens who carry out proactive patrols in relation to antisocial behaviour, environmental crimes such as littering and dog fouling across the city. The timing and location of these patrols is based on intelligence from our environmental enforcement team and members of the public to, to identify hotspot areas. We have a zero tolerance approach to dog fouling as it is particularly antisocial behaviour. It is, however, one of the most difficult offences to witness. Anyone witnessed failing to pick up after the dog will be issued with a fixed penalty notice, which is currently set at £100, but it's reduced to £75 if the penalty is paid early. In the last 12 months, two fixed penalty notices have been issued for the offence of dog fouling. Both were paid in full and therefore no further legal action was required. Wardens regularly undertake spot checks re requesting dog walkers to demonstrate whether they have the means to clear up after their dog. As a result of these approaches, in a recent two-week operation, 136 dog walkers were asked to produce dog bags with only four having no means to clear up after their dog. These were issued written warnings in accordance with our enforcement policy. We continue to encourage all residents to report dog-related issues to us online or by phone, providing any key times or descriptions of offenders. Where intelligence highlights particular issues, targeted resources will be focused on the specific area in an attempt to take action to address the antisocial behaviour. Thank you, Madam Matt. And the next question is from Steve Duncan, a resident of Sunderland, and I believe Councillor Johnson will answer this. The roundabout at Holborn and Chester Roads has long been a bottleneck for residents and commuters who suffer long delays at peak times. At such times, peak time levels of CO2 are increased. This just as young people travel to and from school, while drivers often use roads on surrounding <coughs> estates to avoid the log jam and putting residents at further risk of injury. Can the Council give the residents and wider public a commitment when improvement work on the junction will commence and conclude? Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to thank uh, Washington Steve for the question. <laughs> it is recognised that this is a busy junction. Officers have previously undertaken some modelling which showed that the introduction of other measures such as traffic signals could increase delays. Unfortunately, there are currently no plans to change the layout of this junction as part of the existing capital programme, but we will continue to monitor congestion, delay, and subsequently levels of CO2 on the A183 Chester Road route as part of the local authority's wider approach to network management. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. And the next, well, there's two questions. The first one is from John Thurlwell. Um, a resident of Sunderland, and the second one is from Miguel Smith. And Councillor Johnson again will reply. On Mr Thurlwells, do Sunderland councillors have confidence in the traffic survey work that is undertaken in respect of dangerous junctions? Recent feedback received following submission of a petition is based on old data. I live in Cairns Road, which is off Newcastle Road, and I have seen two serious collisions here and numerous near misses. When are the council going to do something about this? I am grateful for the continued work and support by Councillor Hartnack. <laughs> the question from Miguel, Miguel Smith. Residents on Cairns and Penrith roads have constantly raised concerns with councillors and the council about the junction their street share with Newcastle Road. Will the council agree to work with Highways England and local residents to deliver measures to prevent future accidents? Councillor Johnson. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you to John and Miguel for the, for the question. Uh, the Council have recently responded to a petition regarding this location, and as part of the petition investigations, Northumbria Police's personal injury accident, accident database was investigated. And it was confirmed that no, there have been no registered incidents uh, at this location that suggested the junction is unsafe. There can be several reasons, though, why the accident has not been logged, such as the accident is still under investigation, or no personal injuries were reported. We have conducted both speed and traffic surveys at this location, which demonstrate that the traffic flows and speed of vehicles are not excessive. We've also conducted a road safety assessment, and Cairns Road does not rank within the private locations, and we do not propose to implement any measures at this time. In those circumstances where the assessment warrants improvements, any proposed scheme is subject to consultation with the local community, stakeholders, and any other uh, involved parties. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And the next question is from St Stephen Lewis Elms, a resident of Sunderland, and I believe the leader will reply to this one. Could the leader comment on what Sunderland hopes to gain by the significant powers and funding the new mayoral authority will receive from government and its trailblazer status? Leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and I'd like to thank Stephen Elms for prior notification of his question. A devolution trailblazer deal covering County Durham, Gateshead, Newcastle, North Tyneside, Northumberland, South Tyneside and Sunderland has been agreed between the seven local authorities and the government. The seven council leaders secured the right to agree this deeper devolution deal as part of the North East's original devolution negotiations. The original devolution deal was announced in December 2022 and offers devolved powers and a potential 4.2 billion of investment into the region over the next 30 years across eight themes, transport, an investment fund, skills, education and inclusion, housing, land and digital infrastructure, clean energy and net zero, rural, rural economy and sustainability, culture, tourism and place, and health and public service reform. The Trailblazer deal deepens the devolved powers, giving more resources and decision-making locally on key drivers of local growth, including regeneration, affordable housing, local transport, skills, and employment support. The Trailblazer paves the way and provides the tools to create the Crownwork Studios, one of Europe's largest filmmaking complexes in Sunderland once it's complete. The £450 million studios will transform the economy of the North East, injecting £336 million a year into the regional economy based out of Sunderland, and it will enhance the UK's offer to the global film and high-end TV industry and enable the North East to play a far greater role in future growth. Government backing for the studios and the partnership between Full Wall 73, the Council and the North East Mayoral Combined Authority will enable the North East to become a major hub for big budget productions, capitalising on the productive, loyal workforce the region boasts. The project described as the most economically significant development for the North East since the arrival of Nissan in the 1980s, will bring on final completion 20 sound stages and create over 8,000 jobs in the region. Alongside specialist skills for the UK film industry, those who will benefit from the development being on their doorstep include carpenters, engineers, designers, drivers, electricians, hair and makeup artists and medics, amongst many others. The project, pending planning permission, could see the start of work on the site as early as the summer. Also at our meeting on the 31st of January, the Cabinet welcomed the creation of a new clean energy and green manufacturing investment zone located on and around the International Advanced Manufacturing Park in Washington and Hillthorne Business Park, close to Nissan and the A19. Already, there are companies in the low carbon and high tech manufacturing fields considering expansion or re relocation on this proposed zone. Its merger with IAMP into a bigger international advanced manufacturing strategic site is part of the wider 
Regional Northeast Investment Zone, which is set to create a further 10,000 jobs. It's fantastic for the city to be right at the heart of these plans and to be recognised as a world leading place to do business in these major sectors. With that comes the huge potential for ongoing significant investment, meaning more jobs and skills opportunities for residents of Sunderland and more broadly the North East. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The next question is from Lynn S. Dark, and I believe Councillor Stewart will reply to this one. Could the leader comment on the work undertaken by Sunderland Council in securing the Advanced Autonomous Shuttle Project? What other projects can we expect in the future as part of the work of the Council in developing Sunderland as a smart city? Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, can, I, can I thank Lynn for, for the question? Uh, the Council's smart city ambitions and investment in advanced infrastructure and high-speed 5G connectivity secured the successful government funding bid to deliver the self-driving shuttle project, which will help define a more sustainable future for urban mobility and enhancing accessibility for residents and visitors alike within Sunderland. The shuttle will soon be transporting passengers when it takes to our city streets. This comes after significant achievements as a smart city, ranging from the huge expansion of free public Wi-Fi across the city centre in Roker and the introduction of the 22 digital hubs across the city <coughs> as part of delivering the Labour Party manifesto pledge to bring free Wi-Fi to public buildings and spaces throughout the city. We are also seeing the introduction of smart sensors for our roads through to the adaptive technology uh, for the home that allows residents to remain in their home for longer. And in the coming weeks, the new Sunderland app uh, will be introduced to give a, uh, to go, will go live, enabling greater communication with our residents and the council. Looking ahead, we have two further notable projects in, developing that, uh, in development, working with partners. First is to deploy next generation connectivity to the Stadium of Light and British Esports Arena, which will significantly transform the experiences of tens of thousands of visitors attending football matches, live concerts, and esports tournaments, and will be a great extension to Sunderland's leading smart city infrastructure and the city's super fast 5G connectivity. The second project looks to deliver a number of advanced wireless infrastructure projects. To, to drive digitally empowered future across the whole of the Northeast region. And sectors will include agritech, transport, creative arts, and port operations. The Council's investment in advanced infrastructure and a raft of digital and data solutions is starting to make a profound difference for the residents, businesses, and visitors of the city. And further information, Lynn, can be found at the Sunderland Our Smart City website. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The next question is from Linda Chapman, a resident of Sunderland, and I believe the leader will reply. Could the leader comment on whether it was right of the Conservatives to attempt removing funding at the budget meeting from the redevelopment of the Washington F pit projects to help them get re-elected? To me, this is an important part of Sunderland's and in particular Washington's industrial heritage and the winding engine being a working example of great engineering skills. We should ensure the site becomes a, becomes a community resource and not just a dusty relic. Leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And once again, I'd like to thank Linda Chapman for uh, early notification of her question. Uh, the succinct answer is no. It was not right of the Conservatives to attempt to, to rob Washington residents of investment in Washington. But the same could also be said of the Liberal Democrats, because both opposition parties decided to take the money out of Washington and put it into Sunderland for projects in their own wards and the run into the local elections. Washington F. Pitt Museum is a scheduled ancient monument and one of the city's important heritage assets. It is a well-known landmark and popular and valued asset within the local community. It is a key element 
of the city's wider heritage offer, in particular its industrial mining heritage, with the potential to be able to play a more significant role as a heritage attraction as a result of the redevelopment project. Investment by the Council into the development of the FPIT Museum, including a new visitor centre and cafe on the site, alongside improvements to Albany Park, creates an opportunity not only to provide the museum with a viable and sustainable long-term future, but also for the wider site to play a more strategic role in attracting visitors to Washington and the city as a whole, as well as to play a part in regenerating the local area, which is long overdue. I do hope that Washington residents note how these parties have no interest in delivering any sort of investment into Washington, whilst the Labour Party continues to drive forward with improvements on their behalf. And at the end of the day, Madam Mayor, uh, I was delighted, delighted when uh, both opposition parties decided to try and take that money from Washington because it shows what they really think about our residents. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. And the next question is from Sophie Clinton and Liz Highmore, who are both residents of Sunderland, and I believe Councillor Checker will reply. Could the leader of the council confirm his support for the One Million Women and Girls campaign to ensure that the new mayoral authority takes practical and meaningful steps to improve the lives of women and girls in Sunderland and the region? Could he also provide information on what, on what these meaningful steps could be? Councillor Checker. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I would like to thank both Sophie Clinton and Liz Highmore for this excellent question. The One Million Women campaign is a great example of women coming together to ensure gender-informed policy and decision-making. And I couldn't be more proud to support this. This campaign is one that is close to my heart and one which allows me to outline some of the fantastic work that we as a council and our partners in Sunderland are already doing to promote gender equality, including pioneering investment in women's health hubs, developing a combined domestic abuse and violence against women and girls strategy, investing significant capital into the improvement of women's refuge provision, creating new opportunities to improve access into women's sport and active participation in the regional Transforming Together network. The Mayoral Combined Authority creates a new opportunity to unlock significant investment and change for Sunderland and wider parts of the North East, and harnessing this in a way that addresses the persistent disparities and challenges that women face across various aspects of life, creating a unique opportunity to promote an inclusive and sustainable approach to increased prosperity in our region. When the new North East Mayoral Combined Authority comes into being in May 2024, it will be responsible for the aspirations and life chances of over one million women and girls living in County Durham, Sunderland, South Tyneside, Gateshead, North Tyneside, Northumberland and Newcastle. It will have responsibility for key areas of policy, including economic development, adult education and skills, transport, housing and regeneration. This major change in decision-making in our region brings a unique opportunity to do things differently. Too often, policymakers assume women and men use public services in the same way, but this is often not the case. For example, women are more likely to work in low-paid sectors, have insecure employment, and are the majority of low-paid, part-time, temporary, zero-hours and self-employed workers. Together, these factors mean women are more likely to live in poverty with fewer assets and lower incomes over their lifetime. And too few women work in the industries that will create good jobs in our region in the future, such as digital, advanced manufacturing and renewables. This latest Tory budget is a prime example of why this needs to be discussed. Yet again, the Chancellor has announced tax giveaways that benefit men over women and the better off rather than the most in need. And disappointingly, there was no new money for domestic and sexual violence services. I was proud to hear the Labour candidate for the North East mayoral election, Kim McGuinness, pledge to give a voice to the one million women and girls in our region, prioritise breaking down the barriers to work, women's safety, and to work as hard to smash the gender pay gap as to smash the North East and the North South divide. Madam Mayor, this cabinet, this Labour group, and I'm sure this whole chamber is absolutely committed to this campaign and making this reality for the women and girls in Sunderland. 
This time last week, I attended a fantastic event at Newcastle Civic Centre, where all of the mayoral candidates outlined their manifesto, man, manifesto commitments linked to this campaign and threw their support behind it, one of whom was in the chamber this evening. Madam Mayor, personally, and on behalf of this local authority, I'm proud to sign up to these pledges, which are that we will take practical steps to improve the lives of women and girls in our region. We will work with partners to ensure women and girls can access safe transport, can access housing, good quality jobs, training and adult education. We will listen to women and girls from all communities and act on what they tell us to understand what they need and the barriers they face. We will put in place systems and structures to ensure equality for women and girls. We will explicitly consider the specific impact on women and girls of every policy or strategy we develop, seeking to maximise positive and mitigate negative impacts. And whilst I'm here, Madam Mayor, because I do believe I'm bringing a notice of motion on this exact topic that I don't think will be heard this evening, so I am just going to add in the quote that I was going to say, which is, as women achieve power, the barriers will fall. As society sees what women can do, as women see what women can do, there will be more women out there doing things and we will all be better off for it. That's a quote from Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And the next question is from Nelson TJ. Why did the council buy the Marks and Spencers building for millions of pounds? Why don't they let Marks and Spencer stay in the store for free if they own it? And Councillor Johnson, I believe you're replying. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Nelson, for the question. The Council has a legal duty to obtain best value in property transactions pursuant to Section 123 of the Local Government Act in 1972. The Council acquired the property at 77 to, 77 to 79 High Street West in 2019 to support the ongoing regeneration of this area of the city as set out in the Riverside Sunland Master Plan. And at that point of acquisition, Marks and Spencer's PLC, m and was the incumbent tenant. The Council has engaged with m and on several occasions with regard to its property requirements and the retention of its city centre offer. m and ha has, however, recently indicated that it no longer intends to trade from the property as the format and size of the building does not fit with its current operating model. And this is around 110 that will be closing right across, across the country. m and has, though, made announcements regarding other investments in the city. And Madam Mayor, I'd just like to take this opportunity regarding the absolute rubbish that we heard at the last council meeting regarding letters from m and uh, from the Sunderland Conservatives, um, that at that last full council meeting on the same date, an m and store in Hexham, which is a Conservative controlled council, if no one's aware, announced that it would be closing as well. And guess what? It has ample outside of its store at the entrance, free parking. So it'll be interesting to see what the Hexham Conservatives letter had from m and regarding that. Uh, and unlike all the, the Conservative government and endless ministers that are coming out to say that they have a plan, even suddenly we do have a plan and we're, we're going with it despite any setbacks we have. We're working hard to deliver on that plan, whether that's reopening the cinema, whether that's realigning how our High Street West when m has announced it's closing. And we'll continue to work hard. And if people want that to continue for the city, they shouldn't be voting Conservative. They should be voting Labour. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And the final question is from Megan Keegan, a resident of Sunderland, and I believe the Deputy Leader will be replying. Can the Leader reaffirm Sunderland's commitment to being open and tolerant to those fleeing civil war and persecution? Deputy Leader. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. The Council has made a clear commitment to becoming a city of sanctuary. We will continue to be a city that offers welcome to those who need a safe and supportive place to live. The journey towards this status has absolutely no bearing on home office placement, contrary to what our colleagues across the chamber will have people believe through their campaign of misinformation and community division. Here, here. It does, though, reflect our values of empathy and sympathy for the plight of others and a culture of support that helps people to rebuild their lives in safety and understanding. The Council and all of its partners 
work hard to ensure that everyone feels that as a city we are and we do and we will continue to support and meet the needs of all those who arrive in our wonderful city. We now move on to questions from members of the council. And I believe the first question is from Councillor Catherine Hunter. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Could the leader explain the implications of the proposals for the new Crown Works studio development for the citizens of Sunderland and whether Councillor Mullen was right in opposing the funding they were seeking from government? Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hunter. Thank you for prior knowledge of which is a very good question. Through the development of Crown Work Studios, Sunderland and the North East will become a major destination for film and high-end TV production. The investment will create thousands of jobs for people in communities across Sunderland and the wider region, alongside specialist skills for the UK film industry in production development and post-production there will be a wide range of opportunities from having this development here in the city, including for carpenters, engineers, designers, drivers, electricians, hair and makeup artists and medics. Securing an investment on this scale and significance into the UK requires vision and hard work by everybody involved. It requires strong partnerships to be built up across the public and private sector within the city, the region and nationally. We have seen fantastic support from so many people over the months and years that we have been working together to secure this investment and the government has played a very important role in equipping the region with the tools to enable this investment. I'm looking forward to seeing the role of the city and this region go from strength to strength as the place to do business in the screen industries creating one of Europe's largest filmmaking complexes right here in Sunderland and creating opportunities for people from across our communities and beyond. Under Labour, the likelihood of Sunderland becoming the best medium-sized city in England continues to increase. Councillor Mullen seems to think that it is OK for government to give money to private investors in Tees Valley because, hey, they've got a Tory mayor to an airport that's had millions poured into it that's failing. And thankfully, on this instance, even his government ignored him and his negativity. I've got to be honest, though, surely a Conservative Sunderland councillor effectively saying, don't give us any money because we don't want to develop the city. Uh, even though it will transform Sunderland and the North East with a new creative sector, has to make you question why you would vote for the Conservatives in the first place. If they're that going to be that negative about a massive transformative project coming into the city and the North East, you'd have thought that everybody would have supported it in this chamber, and we didn't get that. And I hope on the 2nd of May that the electorate remember that and don't vote Conservative, they vote for Labour and anybody else. Thank you very much. Councillor Mullen, I believe you've got a personal explanation. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Under Rule 14.29, I do, and it might take about a minute or two to get through. Every now and then there are occasions when, on behalf of the Council, I have had conversations with government, and this is one such occasion. What I said I wouldn't support was the camp campaign specifically for £200 million, because I'd already been involved in conversations with the Chancellor's PPS and the Department for Leveling Up, and knew the amount that had been negotiated, and indeed told our Chief Executive <coughs> before the budget, that it was going to be in the budget papers. So Graham is wrong to say that I support the Tees Valley because it has a Tory mayor and don't support Sunderland, because as far as I understand, I was the only councillor in this room talking to government ministers about this, 
at that time and, and knew in advance that the money was coming and informed our chief executive. So you are wrong, Graham. Later. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for that highly entertaining personal clarification, <laughs> Councillor Mullen. I have to tell you, I didn't realise that you were secretly running me with strings and mirrors behind the scenes, and it's all down to you. Oh, what, can, what can I say? <laughs> I have to tell you, I'm very disappointed, actually. At no stage did you mention to me that you were doing that. That would have been nice to know. That would have been a coordinated approach. That would have been us working uh, collectively and collegiately. Uh, disappointed, Councillor Mullen, you're just focused on basically the, 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 the mean below the bar politics where everything that you're doing is doing about getting a vote because boy do you need some votes by the way. Uh, and I'll tell you what, you could go out there, you couldn't buy a vote if you had a bag full of fivers. Now, I accept your point of personal qualification, I don't believe any of it's relevant because I have to tell you that the officer core here, senior figures in the Labour group, regional figures were talking to government all the time and for many, 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 many months over this. Uh, but if you want to be delusional and think it's all about you, Councillor Mullen, I'm fine with that. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Councillor McDonough. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I don't know what happened there. Councillor um, Edgeworth, I told you, you wanted to blow the bloody <laughs> doors off. <laughs> Lib Dems smashing the place up. Uh, does the Leader of the Council agree that the Conservative Government's unprecedented investment in the Crown Works Studio site is a game changer for the city? I sense you do. And will he outline what plans the Council has to ensure its success, including its strategy to ensure that this investment is a catalyst for further investment into the surrounding area? Thank you. Leader. Now, that's the sort of question that I think would come from somebody who could be leader of the Conservative <laughs> group. <laughs> it's a much better question, <laughs> Councillor McDonough. Uh, I am always thankful for government involvement and cash. Uh, but we had to honestly do a little bit of dragging the government over the line on this. But the government could see the writing on the wall that if they didn't do it, levelling down would have been posters 10 foot high across the city on every <laughs> single thing from which you'd probably have never recovered. Securing an investment on this scale and the significance of it into the UK requires vision and hard work by everyone involved with strong partnerships needed across the public and private sector within the city, the region and nationally. We have seen fantastic support from many people and organisations over the months and years that we have been working together to secure this investment, and it has been years. You know, all of these things start as conversations and small acorns. The announcement of the Trailblazer deal by the government in the spring budget is key to equipping the region with the tools to enable this game-changing investment. Through the development of Crownwork Studios, Sunderland in the North East will become a major destination for film and high-end television production. The investment will create thousands of jobs for people in communities across Sunderland and the wider region, and alongside specialist skills for the UK film industry in production, development, and post-production. The Council will continue to work closely with the investors to bring the Crownwork Studios plans to reality. The planning application for the site has already been submitted and will be determined shortly as well as working closely with the investors and with key partners, including the college, university and North East Screen, the council will continue to bring forward investment at scale in Riverside Sunderland with £500 million of, of investment already committed and coming out of the ground from City Hall to Faber and Maker, Culture House and the new eye infirmary. Sorry, Councillor McDonough, Boris doesn't get to claim this one because there's no government money in it. But, hey, Sunderland will carry on delivering, delivering it. Building on this success to date, through the creation of one of Europe's largest filmmaking complexes here in Sunderland, 
We will continue to play our role as a council in catalyzing development and investment in our city for the benefit of all of our communities. And I genuinely appreciate the government coming with us on this journey. It was very important, and I'm delighted we got the money and we got it across the line. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Supplementary, Madam Mayor. Councillor McDonough. Uh, yes, can I just ask the leader if he would be willing to give us regular updates on this project uh, going forward at a full council level? Obviously, it's a very, very important project for the city. And also, um, if the Crown Studios was to make a film of Councillor Miller's life, who would play you? <laughs> well, yet another fantastic question from the future leader of the Conservative group. Happy to give updates. It will be at planning very shortly. Once we get it through planning, the initial tranche of money coming from the trailblazer enables us to do the groundworks to make sure the site is fit and ready to go for whatever comes through planning as a, a build-out process to build the first six sound studios and film studios. Uh, clearly, somebody of my magnificent looks, I would probably have to say, it's got to be my uglier, younger brother, Brad Pitt. <laughs> but I, I would live with Jason Statham, to be honest. There's nothing wrong with a bit of Statham. He's bald. He just need, I take the glasses off. Will that satisfy you, Councillor McDonough? <laughs> I can live with that. Thank you. Councillor Edgeworth. Oh, I can't follow that, can I? Um, what assessment has the council made of the increase in traffic volumes and speeding along the B1405, which is along Springwell Road, Holborn Road, Front Road and European Way, since the opening of the Northern Spire Bridge and what steps will be taken to improve crossing facilities for pedestrians, school crossing patrol provision and air quality along this route? Thanks. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Edgeworth, for the question. As part of the planning considerations for the Northern Spire Bridge, Changes in traffic patterns on the local road network were subject to transport and environmental assessment to ensure any impacts were minimised. Traffic volumes are monitored along all three phases of the Sun and Strategic Transport Corridor, along with localised air quality monitoring. These will continue to be monitored and evaluated. However, there are currently no requirements for mitigation. Where requests for service are received, officers will carry out a full assessment and fully consider those requests. And where feasible, any detailed scheme will be subject to community engagement and consultation. The council currently has no open advert to recruit school cross patrol. The council currently has an open advert to recruit school cross patrol officers and offer successful candidates the opportunity to fill a vacancy close to their home address. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Joseph. Thank you for the response, Kevin. Um, I wonder if I send some details to you whether you could help us look at two issues. One is a crossing at Springwell Road opposite the medical centre, which is going to be Massively expanded, there's no crossing nearby, and there's a lot of old people who try to cross four lanes of traffic and are finding really difficult, especially with the increased um, volume along Springwell Road. And secondly, is a review of the roundabout at the junction of St Luke's um, front Westmore roads and European Way, which is a really badly laid out um, roundabout for the amount of traffic that goes through it, especially with the Northern Spire Bridge. So if I send some details, could you work with us on those two issues, please? Yes, Councillor Edgeworth, that's not a problem. If you send the details through, happy to set up some meetings and we can discuss those. And I'm sure when you become the uh, deputy, uh, the, the leader of the majority opposition group after me, this will be one of the first things that's in your entry. Thank you, Madam. <laughs> Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, could the leader comment on the climate change commitments made by this council and why it is so important to become the carbon neutral as a city. Could he comment on the deliberate decision by, more th by both main opposition parties to seek withdrawal of council funding to achieve these commitments? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Deputy Leader. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you, Councillor Blackburn, um, for his question. Madam Mayor, together with our partners across the city, we have set out a target for Sunderland to be carbon neutral by 2040. Climate change is the biggest challenge of our generation and it affects everyone in Sunderland, across the UK and around the world. 
We must play our part as a city in tackling this global challenge, which requires a long-term cross-party approach. Addressing climate change will also help to improve the health of our residents, raise housing standards, as well as reduce fuel poverty, which is crucial as our residents continue to struggle through ongoing cost of living crisis. It will provide opportunities for new jobs and investment in the green economy from which the city and its residents can benefit. We must commit council funding and resources alongside wider investment which we are able to secure to support our residents to attract key investment, bring forward innovative solutions and work with partners across the city regionally and nationally to make progress against this incredibly important commitment. We must do this for our young people and for generations to come and we must act now. And I hope that Madam Mayor, that our opposition colleagues have had time to reflect on the comments over budget and I'm sure with some time I'll accept how important this is to our city. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Peacock. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Northumbrian Water have a sewage pumping station in St Anne's located alongside the River Weir below the A19 bridge, reference uh, NZ 34920-56743, for anybody interested. Northumbrian Water have advised me directly that bacteria is not tested for in non-bathing waters and there are no designated bathing waters along the River Weir. Will the portfolio holder commit to working with ward councillors in wards along the riverside to apply for suitable sections of the river to be included under the Bathing Waters Directive in order to monitor and improve water quality for those entering the water for recreational purposes. Thank you. Leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and I'd like to thank Councillor Peacock for a, a prompt notification of his question. Uh, and I do sympathise with the question. Uh, I think it's a valid point raised. Uh, however, I can advise that the application process for the designation of bathing waters is open to any person. There are, however, specific criteria set out by DEFRA which are required as a minimum, including the demonstrable use of the specific water by at least 100 swimmers per day. And this does not include other users such as kayakers, though I haven't seen many kayaks up the River Weir in the last few months, in addition to toilet facilities being within 500 metres. Without evidence of these minimum criteria being met, it is not possible to apply for consideration of an inland or coastal water to be a designated bathing site, unfortunately. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Supplementary, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, the Sunderland Rowing Club has been located less than 500 metres from this sewage pumping station since it was uh, redeveloped there. They hold national events and regattas quite regularly. Last year, several members of the rowing club became unwell after involuntarily entering the water during rowing activities. Do you think, Leader, it is acceptable to have several unmonitored sewage runoffs into a river location? where our city's rowing club operate, and why have the council never addressed this previously? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I don't think that's to the tone of the, the question that was asked Councillor Peacock. If there's sewage runoffs, that would have to be taken up with Northumbria Water. Uh, it's not, as far as I'm aware, a council responsibility, but I do suggest that you have a conversation with the portfolio holder responsible and with the senior officer for who, into, into whose directorate it sits and see if there's anything we can do. People getting ill could be for a variety of reasons and uh, I'm not necessarily leaping to the conclusion of what was causing that, which is part of your supplementary question, Councillor Peacock, I believe. I don't think it's right to do that. This, this is an interesting point you raise. If it genuinely is something you want to look at, the council, I think, can look at it with you.
Councillor Paul Gibson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Residents who live near busy main roads, such as Doxford Parkway, often ask if roads could be resurfaced with a low noise road surface in order to lessen the impact of traffic. However, the Council to date has not been willing to consider this. Could the Council commit to investigating low noise road surface and look at the cost versus normal road resurfacing in order to improve the quality of life for residents where appropriate? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Gibson, for the question. Uh, the Council has used alternative resurfacing materials in the past with noise reducing properties. However, these are more expensive and do not have the same lifetime qualities as traditional surfacing products. A section of Doxford Parkway is included in the 2024-25 Highway Maintenance Programme and it is planned to use traditional surfacing at this location. The new material will be smoother and more even, which will have a beneficial effect on, on noise reduction. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Laws. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The recent development by Northumbria Police of a dedicated motorbike unit was a key pledge of the Labour Party. What impact can residents expect in the years ahead in addressing this antisocial behaviour through the delivery of this pledge? Deputy Leader. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. I think we've covered a lot of motorbikes tonight. It's turned into an episode of Top Gear, I think. Um, I just I just refer, thank Councillor Laws for his questions and just refer him to, to the... Um, that this has been this disorder unit has been set up to challenge this antisocial behaviour and to um, reassert the statistics that just since September we've had 15 civil orders served, 30 vehicles seized, and 15 arrests being made. And I think this is a big advancement at the very early stages of this unit, and I hope that provides some confidence and reassurance for people. And we'll continue to challenge the tenancies and assist the identification of individuals. Going forward, Madam Mayor, we fully expect to see a decrease in the number of reported incidents linked to motorbike disorder. Thank you. Councillor Vera. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The construction work on the seafront has caused tailbacks and difficulties for motorists, turning into or existing side streets off Roker Terrace. Is the Council monitoring the progress of the construction work and can the Cabinet Member set out a timescale for this completion, please? Thank you. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Vera, for the question. I would like to take this opportunity to thank residents and motorists for their ongoing patience during the construction of the new active travel cycle route along the A183 uh, Whitburn Road. Construction of the project was split into two phases to which uh, minimised disruption over the busy summer and also to support the World Triathlon Series. Uh, the council has experienced managers on site to supervise the works and any concerns raised are given immediate and careful consideration to help maintain access and road safety. I'm happy to confirm that the phase two of the works are due to be completed during this month, March 2024, and the project will then enter a 12-month monitoring and evaluation period. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Haswell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, can the portfolio holder update Council on plans to relocate the Sunderland Coat of Arms, which sits on the former City, li city Library on Forced Street, and can they give assurances it will be restored and sited in a prom prominent location on a civic building in the city? Thank you. Councillor Price. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Haswell, for this question. As we know, the former City Library building in Fawcett Street is still in the ownership of the Council, and the expectation is that the Court of Arms will stay fixed until such time that there is a clear picture about the future use of the building. In the meantime, we'll explore opportunities to highlight the Court of Arms, working with colleagues in local studies and the Heritage Sunderland Partnership as appropriate. And through our UK Shared Prosperity Fund, we'll look at projects. We will look at a suitable relocation and refurbishment when necessary. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Haswell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and I appreciate the, the time taken to get me that response. And would you um, please get in touch with me when the time comes, when they are ready to start looking at relocating it. I have an incredibly passionate couple of residents who want to see the coat of arms recited. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 
Yes, through surprise. you, Matt. Certainly, Councillor, I'll come back to you with that. Thank you. I now call upon the Leader to move the report and the supplementary report of the Cabinet. I so move, Madam Mayor. Deputy Leader, do you second the report? I second the report, Madam Mayor, and reserve the right to speak. Le Leader, would you like to speak to the report? No, Madam Mayor, there's only one item. It's the independent remuneration panel, and uh, it's clearly laid out for everybody to see. I believe there's su supplementary reports on the Freedom and the Alderman. Deputy Leader, Leader. Oh, I so move them as well, Madam Mayor, and reserve the right to speak if necessary. I second the amendment, um, the addition, Madam Mayor, and reserve the right to speak. If anyone wishes to speak, please raise your hand and state whether you have an amendment, a comment or a question. Councillor Edgeworth. Could you confirm which report that's in respect of? Councillor Mullen. Councillor Mullen, a comment on? A comment on, could you confirm the item please? On both the Alderman and the Freedom. Councillor Johnston. Just a comment on um, number two. Councillor Dixon. Um, two comments on uh, number two, please. So, Madam Mayor, the... Sorry. Apologies. Councillor Butler. Comment on number two, please. So, Madam Mayor, as there's been an amendment um, that would be dealt with first, so Councillor Edgeworth would need to move the amendment, please. Councillor Edgeworth. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I'd just like to move an amendment in respect of item one of the Cabinet's report and the supplementary report, which recommends um, agreeing the recommendations for the independent remuneration panel to continue the current scheme into the next um, financial year. So I'd like to amend um, that report. So instead of agreeing with the panel's recommendation, um, we would like to see the following changes to the scheme which are a reduction of 5% in the basic allowance to £7,951, and then a suite of changes to special responsibility allowances, um, leader of the council, um, SRA, to be changed, and based on political groupings, percentage control, and capped at £30,134. Um, the deputy leader, similar change, capped at £20,089. Um, a cabinet secretary, SRA, to be set based on political groupings, percentage control of the council and capped at £20,089. Um, cabinet member with portfolio SRA to be set based on political groupings, percentage control of the council and capped at £16,573. Um, the deletion of any SRA for cabinet uh, deputy cabinet members. Um, the leader of the majority group in opposition uh, allowance would be calculated as percentage of the leader's SRA up to a maximum of 25%. The leader of the second largest group in opposition allowance calculated as a percentage of the majority opposition group leader's allowance up to a maximum of 50%. Um, a change in the scrutiny coordinating committee SRA re reduced to 4,143. Of the thematic scrutiny committee chairs to 4,143. Of area committee chairs to 8,280. Of licensing and regulatory committee to 6,695 pounds. And of planning and highways committee to £6,695. The removal of all um, SRAs for vice chairs of area committees, scrutiny coordinating committee, licensing and regulatory committee, and planning and highways committee. A reduction of the co optees allowances of audit and governance committee chair to 4,000 and of independent members to 2,000. A removal of the mayoral and deputy mayoral allowance um, to zero and abolish all provision for subsistence allowance and abolish all provision for reimbursement of broadband and telephone costs. Councillor Edgeworth, can I ask who seconds the report? 
I'll second the amendment. Thanks. Do you wish to speak to the amendment? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll speak briefly. Um, we don't have a problem with the report's proposal in terms of the pool of members that the panel um, can pick from. I think that's um, sensible, but I do think we um, need to take this opportunity to once again make sure that residents see that the councillors are sharing the burden of cuts and council tax hikes that this council is imposing on them. So that's why we're moving again um, a sensible package of measures to reduce the cost of special responsibility allowances um, to show show that willing and um, give Labour and colleagues another chance to do the right thing by cutting their own allowances, just like I did last year. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Fagan, do you wish to speak? I don't wish to speak at this point, thank you. Leader? And it was all going so well. <laughs> Look, I am surprised, Madam Mayor, that the City Solicitor allowed this given that this was all agreed at the budget meeting that we've just had in February. And this is a, an amendment that's coming in on the fact that the independent remuneration panel have had to make changes. So we, we basically said that we would keep their scheme because it's the independent remuneration panel scheme that we agree on. On the point about you taking a, a much needed pay cut, Councillor Edgeworth, I think you'll find that was Councillor Mullen getting his own back and uh, doing that to you. We've, as a council, felt the pain and not raised allowances for 12 years, whilst everybody else has had some sort of pay increase in that period. Councillors have not. And we've always, basically, even though the Independent Enumeration Panel has several times suggested that we increase their allowances, because there was cost of living crisis and it was very acute. This chamber has said no to it. So I disagree entirely with this proposal. It, I don't even believe we should be discussing it. I think it should never have been allowed to come to the floor. I'm very disappointed it has mm -hmm. and that this Labour group will oppose you on it, I'm afraid, Councillor Edgeworth. But you know we were going to do that because this is possibly, sure a, possibly a bit more to do with the 2nd of May than <laughs> half past seven tonight when we're we, we, we've finished here. So we will say no to this, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, because it should be the independent remuneration panel that determine what the offer for councils is and this group. But it's their recommendation and it's then up to us to either agree or disagree it. We do not set the, the allowances scheme for councillors in this council, though the Liberal Democrats seem to think they should. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Can we take a vote on the amendment? If the officer could ring the division bell and start the vote running, please. So the vote should be running now, members. How are we doing? Where's Denny? He's out for the top. God, he's going to miss it. Doesn't matter, does it? Oh, he does. Well, just he'll have the whip. 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 Oh, you got a tongue, sure. You can see where we're bloody murdered. So the vote the will, will be closing now, members. I was I was when I was disciplined with, from the lost city, city, city hall, civic centre. I wonder what happened to it. And there are 22 votes in favour, 45 against, so the amendment is defeated. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mullen.
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just did some quick maths, and under that amendment, there is potential for Councillor Ed Edgeworth's allowance to go up. Um, <laughs> Um, first of all, can I just say that I hope that John Anderson, the former chair of the Independent Remuneration Panel, is all right. He's been absent for a long period of time, which is why this report's coming forward, and we send him our best wishes and to welcome new members of the panel. Um, given that this is an extraordinary circumstance, I think it would be right for the panel to convene as soon as they possibly can, rather than in line with the normal timetable and for new members of the panel to get to know the different groups as the previous panel has done over recent years and to take evidence from us straight away rather than to delay that until um, the end of the calendar year. Um, do you want me to speak now on the Alderman as well? Thank you, yes. I strongly support, as you can imagine, the uh, giving of a position of Alderman to Peter Wood. I, I often think of Alderman in the city being like our equivalent of, of the House of Lords and if we did have such a thing I think Peter would be worthy and in fact probably worthy of the actual House of Lords. He is uh, admired across the chamber particularly because of his knowledge of transport and education matters. He has served as a councillor for longer than many of us have been alive although I don't think he'd care for me to say that and he continues to play an active role in the ward that he represented on the council most recently and I think for all we talked at the beginning of the meeting about losing experience, having a, an active set of aldermen um, like Mark Greenfield is, uh, really brings benefit to the council and to our community. So I fully support Peter Wood having this award. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll speak briefly just about the Henri Freed Miller City. Um, as, as a Sunderland fan, it's wonderful to see Kevin Ball, a legend of the club, being rewarded in this way. But I'll say no more on that because Councillor Michael Dixon is an even bigger Sunderland fan than me and will deal with that more substantively. The other one is just to congratulate Joe Fowler. His Veterans in Crisis charity has done some vital work across our city, helping a lot of people. And obviously his ERV centre is based just at the top of Rook Avenue on my ward. That centre has been a fantastic facility helping veterans, but Joe has been more actively involved in our community, helping all people, doing wonderful work. And just to say he richly deserves this award for all he's done. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Butler. Thank you, Madam Mayor, last but not least. Um, but I would like just to put my weight behind the freedom of the city um, with obviously Kevin Ball and Joe Fowler. They're both very, very good friends of Southwick. Uh, Kevin switched our lights on, which was fantastic. He's, he's a legend of the city. Um, and Joe, uh, as Councillor Johnson has already said, does some fantastic work with veterans in crisis mm -hmm. across the city. And I know how much time and effort um, he puts into that. And uh, I was delighted to visit him the other day. Uh, it is in St. Peter's Ward, where it borders the Southwick Ward. And obviously, we just like to push out into other wards. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Dixon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the one on Kevin Ball is going to be the longest comment in history, but I'll, um, I'll try and manage to get it inside the five minutes. Um, I will mention Peter Wood briefly. It's about a year ago that I was standing here to sort of say well done to him after his long career is over. So it's lovely to... Um, to see he's been recognised in this way, thanks to the, the Cabinet for that. And, and congratulations to, to Louise Farthing for a similar award. Um, Peter will be um, a great um, enhancement to the, uh, the civic representation in this city. And, um, you know, I'm really pleased that he's, he'll be joining Mark Greenfield as a worthy representative. As far as Kevin Ball's concerned, um, I'm really pleased that the Cabinet has supported our proposal to confer upon him the honorary freedom of the city. Uh, I'm sure when the ceremony, subject to agreement tonight, takes place, we will see how proud Kevin will be to accept this award. But as a Sunderland City Councillor and supporter of the football club for well over 60 years, I would like to assure him and colleagues here tonight how delighted I am to have begun the procedure to get where we are this afternoon in him receiving this ward via the council's report. When the idea first came to me, I quickly conferred with a couple of fellow councillors, Councillor Mel Spedding and Dominic McDonough, both football people. 
got a positive response and with Councillor Miller fully aware of the significance of football to our city, I was more than hopeful that progress could be made when the proposal was put to him and colleagues and so it has proved. There's little doubt that the football club and the people of Sunderland have a very close relationship. In fact, that is an understatement. They are inseparable. It impacts on so many people, either directly through active attendances at the matches, to those who follow the team but can't make the games for a variety of reasons, to a general talking point throughout the week with never-ending debate, as in, as in the case of my household. And even the thousands of people with just a passing interest in football are fully aware of the presence and massive significance of the club to the city and in the lives of others. In my time as a supporter going back to 1959, Kevin Ball was one of, if not the most significant and important person to have been associated with the club. Player, captain, positions in the academy, under 18 coach, senior development coach, interim manager twice, and club ambassador a list of roles that Kevin has filled, and there are probably more besides. Add to these the countless examples of personal kindness shown to fans and organisations who have needed support or fundraising, and you have a mighty impressive person here. We will, I trust, get an opportunity to speak in more detail about Kevin at the awards cer ceremony, but in the meantime, I'd like to borrow the words of the club historian, Rob Mason, whom I've known for many years, and in his 400-page hardback book called Sunderland AFC, The Absolute Record, The Players, which would be my choice of reading if ever I was consigned by uh, the opposition parties to a desert island. In it, Rob says about Kevin Ball, Kevin Ball's impact at Sunderland goes beyond his performance and statistics. Kevin earned his respect from supporters, managers, and importantly, fellow players. As captain, Borley could be guaranteed to get the maximum out of the players on his side. That wasn't down to aggression, not that anybody of sane mind would pick a fight with Kevin, but the fact that he led by example. If anyone wasn't pulling their weight, they would be left in no doubt about their responsibilities that came with the privilege of being Sunderland players. On our behalf, he took his responsibilities very seriously. Kevin was a clear link between the supporters and the club. He was our representative. This award is the highest honour the city can bestow, traditionally given by Sunderland City Council to those who have made significant positive contributions to the reputation and well-being of the city and its residents. That sums up Kevin Ball perfectly. To conclude, football, the people of the city and now the council are brought together here by an outstanding individual, and I hope tonight we can take a further step towards a green for an official ceremony to be arranged to bestow Kevin Ball with the honorary freedom of the city. Thank you. Deputy Leader, do you wish to speak? Um, thanks, Madam Mayor. I've got nothing further to add on that. Thank you. I would like to thank councillors uh, for their warm words regarding our older man, our proposed older woman, and our two candidates for freedom of the city, both very, very valid and utterly uh, deserving of the freedom for quite different reasons. And I look forward to councillors from across the chamber giving fulsome uh, speeches at the ceremony whenever we can get it in the diary and get it agreed. So I'd like to thank everybody for that. Even Councillor Edgeworth for his attempt at hijacking the finance budget with a dodgy amendment. Uh, I do appreciate why you did it, but obviously no. So thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Do you accept the report and supplementary report of the Cabinet? Next is a report on action on petitions. Does any member wish to comment on the report? Councillor Tai. Councillor Tai. 
Yeah, can I just thank officers for recognising the request from residents, but more importantly, thank the residents of Ditton Gardens and Hartley Drive for raising the petition and presenting it to council, showing that people powered really does get, uh, count and that when residents take a matter seriously, this council will listen. Thanks very much. Can we accept the report? The next item tonight is reports, which includes a report of the Leader on special urgency decisions and a report and supplementary report on appointments to committees and outside bodies. We will take these in turn, starting with the Leader's report on special urgency decisions. Leader, would you please move the report? I agree to move the report, Madam Mayor, and there have been none. Thank you very much. Deputy Leader, do you second the report? Second the report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Does Council agree to receive the report? Agreed. Next, we will deal with the report and supplementary report on appointments to committees and outside bodies. Leader, would you please move the report? I so move the report, Madam Mayor. Deputy Leader, do you second the report? I second the report, Madam Mayor. Are the ungrouped councillors able to provide the names of the outstanding nominations allocated to them? No, Madam Mayor. Prior notice has been received from Councillor Edgeworth that he wishes to speak on the report. Does anyone else wish to speak or move an amendment? <laughs> Councillor Edgeworth. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I wondered if we could request a separate vote on recommendation uh, 5.19, uh, which is that the Chief Executive be delegated to nominate two councillor appointments to the Washington Town Board and to invite a local community leader to act as chair of that town board. Um, just as a matter of principle, we think that councillor appointments should be agreed uh, by those who are democratically elected and not officers and that they should be ratified by full council, or perhaps in this case, by the Washington Area Committee, um, given the subject. So um, we'd request a separate vote on that recommendation only, please, which we will we'll be voting against. Thanks. Leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I wish the government had set it up that way, Councillor Hesworth, but it's their rules because I could possibly agree with you on this. Unfortunately, the town board structure is very, very simple. The chief executive has been given the authority. Councillors have no authority in this matter. Therefore, this chamber has no authority on it. What the chief exec is bringing forward is the recommendations and what's happening from government. Uh, and that's, that's how it runs. I do, there's, no, there's no point in us doing this because the chief executive will just have to ignore it. Chief Executive, if you feel you need to speak on this, and I am trying to stop you from speaking because you're, you shouldn't get involved in a political conversation like this, but that's where we are. Uh, I would love to be able to say, yeah, let's have a vote on who the councillors are going to be, but we can't. I was precluded from, from that other than I get a consultation on it because I'm the leader of the council, but that decision is taken by the Chief Executive and nobody else, I'm afraid. I just thought I'd clarify that for everyone. Can we take the separate vote in respect of recommendation regarding Washington Town Board? If the... With the greatest respect, Madam Mayor, we can't. It's not something that we have any... If we vote and vote to overturn the... And the please tell me if I'm wrong. If we vote to overturn what the Chief Executive has proposed, it falls because we have no power to enforce this because this is government regulation and how town boards actually work. The chief executive is the arbiter, not this council, and certainly not the council leader.
Madam Mayor, can I just um, say something? It does say that it's guidance by the department for levelling up. So it doesn't, it's, doesn't seem to suggest that is a stringent rule. It seems like it's suggested, but the rule is on, on becoming of the council to recommend a solution. That's how I'm reading it. Tell me if I'm wrong. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'll just try and clarify. So we are still receiving guidance on Towns Fund. We haven't received all the guidance yet on how, but we do have a time scales to put an interim board in place. These arrangements are enabling us to put an interim board in place by 1st of April. We still haven't got all the guidance, what the interim board should look like and how it should be done. So we would bring a report back to a future council meeting to make permanent appointments in terms of local councillors this is just for the interim arrangements. Once we've um, identified who the chair should be, who the other relevant members and um, people who should be appointed to the board, we will come back to a future meeting. I think once we see what the guidance says, we'll then be able to get further guidance to members at that time. So we are still, we still haven't got all the guidance yet from Government, we're just trying to get something in place to meet Council government Council O'Brien, guidance. let the Chief finish. Okay. Right, Council O'Brien, did you want to say something? Yeah, I'm not comfortable with that. If we don't know the rules, we shouldn't be setting policy. So I, my suggestion would be still to vote, vote on this. We have to notify government of an interim board by 1st of April. Government still haven't sent us the guidance for the full final arrangements. So I've got to put something in, as local authority being the capital body, we have to put something in place. So we're putting, yes? Well, by government guidance, I need to be, I need, I need to notify government of our arrangements by this time next week. So I need the ability to just do that. Councillor O'Brien, please stand up and put your mic on if you want to speak. Does Thank the government you. specify this has to be done, or is it just guidance? That's the issue. If, if, you're speci if it's a rule, I'm happy to go along with it. If it's just guidance, because we don't actually know how these boards are going to be working. I'm not comfortable giving you carte blanche on appointing anyone you want. I'm just not. This is not democracy. We are, a, we, we, we are a democratic institution which should follow democratic rules, i.e. 
this body should be voting on it, not unelected officers. I think, Councillor O'Brien, I'm asking Council to give me delegated responsibility for short-term appointments to the board to come back once we have the full arrangements in place. That's in line with what this government is telling us and asking us to do as a local authority. Point of order, Madam Mayor. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. We're, um, we're happy to vote against the whole report rather than a separate vote, if that provides a way forward and still allows us to put our objections on the record. So are we going to take a vote against, sorry, a vote from the reports as a whole? <laughs> Madam Mayor, I think for democracy, we, we need to allow a vote. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, since there's an element of confusion, I fully understand Councillor Edgeworth and O'Brien's perspective on this. But the, from what was explained to me as leader of the council, this is something that the government is telling us has to be done this way, and we've got a timetable to do it by which the chief executive is responsible for, for dealing with. Now, if that means we have a vote on whether we agree what's in the report or not, I think we should do that just so that councillors can say they've asked for it. Uh, obviously, this side of the chamber will be voting in support of what is put down as recommendations. Well, that would, be, that would be a constitutional crisis, Councillor O'Brien. We'll take an electronic vote. Could the officer... So the, so the vote, I understand, is on the report as a whole. Perhaps the mayor could confirm it's yeah. on the report as a whole, the whole recommendations. So if the officer could ring the division bell, please, and open the vote. Point of order, Madam Mayor. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, Sorry, Madam Mayor. Just to clarify what we're actually voting on here, there's some slight confusion. <laughs> When you say the report as a whole, does this include freedom of the city and as well? Goodness me. Okay, thank you. Madam, yes. Madam Mayor, if I could yes. clarify through, through you, the meeting is currently dealing with the appointments report, to which there's also a supplementary report, and the vote that members are being asked to take now is in respect of all of the recommendations set out on the appointments report and the supplementary to the appointments report. The cabinet report dealing with the freedom has already been dealt with. So this report is just on the appointments report. So if the division bell could be rung, please, and the vote opened. Thank you. So the vote should be running members. Madam Mayor, can I have a point of clarification, please? Having just voted previously. I don't wish to cause any confusion, but I've already voted, so I've got to vote again. This is the, the last vote I made is at null and void. Well, it's just been lit up again. No. I would, Stephen, not for you, I'll not change anything. 
just voting on this, can we double the so, Can we close the vote now, please? <laughs> I just we already voted. So 47 votes in favour, 9 abstentions and 12 votes against, so the report is carried. Thank you. We'll now go back to the outstanding motions from the last ordinary meeting of the Council. We'll now deal with the notice of motion which is titled A Smart City That Doesn't Leave Anyone Behind. I call upon Councillor Heather Fagan to read and move the motion. Council members are asked to consider the undimensional motion, um, a smart city that doesn't leave anyone behind. The council agrees to ask the cabinet to review how council services are offered in Sunderland and to take appropriate steps to make sure that everyone in our city can access services, even if they cannot or do not want to go digital. The council's goal is that the cost of services does not differ depending on whether you pay using cash or whether you use electronic payment methods. That nobody is put under undue, undue pressure to access a service digitally if they are not able to do so independently and that analogue access is provided efficiently, effectively and without barriers. This should include a review of policies governing telephone calls by residents of the Council's customer service network. I'm going to pose that motion. Councillor Bond, do you second the motion? Councillor Fagan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm going, to, I'm going to try and keep this quite brief because we are quite keen to get onto the Ed Davy motion. So we, we want to try and get through this tonight if we can. <laughs> so this motion has come about because we are hearing from residents in our wards that life is becoming harder due to, to the need to be online. This is a barrier for many resident people who access council services as well as other resources such as the NHS and government information. There is a growing concern amongst the digitally isolated that they are being forgotten about as more services are moved to online or accessed via apps. And it is something we really must be mindful of when digitising services that the Council provide. With each new development in technology, there are groups of people who will get left behind every time. This, is also, this also makes existing inequalities around race, gender, age, ability and income worse. The lack of, the lack of digital skills and access can have a huge negative impact on a person's life leading to poorer health outcomes, lower life expectancy and social isolation. In the UK, 27% of people still have low digital capability. And in Sunderland, recent research suggests that what, around one in three people are either experiencing or have experienced some form of digital exclusion. Whilst we need to work to close these gaps, the reality is that not everyone wants to be online. Accessible services and offline alternatives are essential to ensure people are not left in a behind in an increasingly connected world. Looking at the Sunderland Our Smart City website, I was reading about the wonder of the web sessions that the Council have been offering Council staff and members of the public to kickstart their digital journey, teaching the basics of how to use Google and how to use the internet safely. This is a great initiative by the Council to encourage people to get online. It seems that the Council staff embrace these sessions with 140 attending. However, despite six sessions being available for members of the public, only four people attended. The sessions were ironically advertised online, but to be fair, were also advertised via 2,000 leaflets distributed around shops and fed in through the VCS networks, but turnout was very poor. For some people, they simply just don't want to be online, and we need to accept that no matter what opportunities are made available, it's just not for them, and we therefore need to ensure an offline service can be easily accessed instead. We must support those who are digitally isolated, these are often our elderly or vulnerable residents, so are already need an extra help without being excluded from accessing services. I don't want any more residents contacting me saying they've been questioned by the council call centre staff because they simply want to book an appointment at the tip 
and have been interrogated as to why they can't book online themselves, or others who have parked in their usual car parks to find they now can only pay for parking via an app and have got back in the car and gone home. Or residents who are physically handed in letters to the City Hall, just in the, in, the, in the area there, often multiple times to find when they follow up they've gone missing. We seem to be incapable of managing paper anymore and this is frustrating for residents who still communicate in this way. It's unfair and upsetting for residents who already feel disconnected. These aren't one-off experiences. Other councils will confirm they've had similar conversations with residents. We need to keep working on fixing the digital divide, but in the meantime, we need to give a full, kind and courteous service to all of our residents, whether it's online, phone, face-to-face -face, or letter. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Are there any amendments? Does anyone wish to speak to the motion? Councillor Madam Mullen. Mayor, we've had prior notice from Councillor Mullen and Councillor Ty. Councillor Stewart. So, Madam Mayor, these speakers are Councillors Mullen, Ty, Stewart, Bond, and Councillor Fagan has the right of reply. Councillor Mullen. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, aware of the irony I'm giving this from an iPad. Um, the Conservative group supports this motion and agree that it's important that whilst we continue to think about um, people who are digitally disengaged as we develop the smart city policy, we agree with the ambition of becoming a smart city where people are better connected and where we benefit from the integration of new technologies in public service. But we're also conscious that there will be a core of people among our residents who either by preference or through no choice of their own, such as uh, lack of skills, will not be a part of this new digital world. And I think we should also be making similar requests of partners to have this in mind. There's a tendency for Northumbria Police, for example, to want people to report non-emergency crime via a web form rather than speaking to somebody in person or over the phone. And similarly, my own recent experience of trying to get in touch with the council via the phone when there was an emergency at St Mary's car park took 15 minutes just to speak to somebody. I think that this motion is right to say that it does feel like public services are pressurising people to use web forms and the internet rather than other modes of communication which will disproportionately impact on older people. So whilst we want to see the smart city agenda develop and integrated around the city, this seems like a sensible provision to act as a safety net for people who aren't digitally capable. Councillor Tai. Thanks, Madam Mayor. And likewise, the Labour Group will be supporting the motion. And we did toy on, on adding, a, adding an additional one in, to be fair, about encouraging our partners. Um, because I think what, what you say as well, Councillor Mullen, is right on the ever-evolving world of digital, and, and there's a lost generation in that. In, I'll use specifically one example, if I'm here, and, and it's a partner organisation, so it doesn't affect the council, but we'll all have, or the majority of our have, have elderly parents who just have no concept of how to do everything, and, and as, as, as children, we get the phone calls, can you come and help us do that? How do I do this? And, and it, it is the simple things. For one example, the doctor's surgery, what, what she is involved in, in total, there's three apps. There's the NHS app. So if she wants to do certain things, she has to somehow fathom the NHS app. She then has an app called Clicks, and that's to be able to make an appointment to go to the doctors. And if she wants to order a repeat prescription, she has to use an app called Patient Access. So that gives an example for a, a, an elderly lady coming on a 80-year-old, how difficult it is to be able to unravel that. And it is those that don't have any family, don't have anyone to help them, are completely lost. Because my mum says that over and over again. I've got no idea if, I'd, if I didn't have you, how, how I would be able to unravel this and do that. And especially given that, that, that a number of these um, surgeries are taken away, telephone access, so you can't phone them. So you're absolutely forced down that line to go and do that. Or in, in, in the case of Silksworth, as the councillors have been told, they can go to the surgery. Well, that's not so easy if you're housebound and... and, and I think that's why I would have liked to have, to have included partners, but what we didn't want to do was detract from, from the notice of motion that you have suggested, because it is really important. We can influence here at council. 
we have less so, less so influence within our partners. But I think one of the things that, that I, and I think I've talked about this at our area committee as well, is the, the digital hubs provide not just a really good opportunity for um, those that don't want to use to be taught if they wish, but also within the digital hubs, and, and, and Joanne manages a project where there is a couple of digital hubs, what the staff have resorted to doing is actually doing it for the, 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 the residents that come in using the computer. Yeah, they might not want uh, to participate, might, want, might, might not want to do it themselves. Um, a, a really good example of that was the, there was some garages potentially going to be demolished, which some residents were, were, were completely unhappy about. They had to make their representations online. What we ended up doing is, is sitting with those residents and doing that, that, that work on their behalf. But I think, again, Councillor Fergan, you made a really good point about how we get that message across. How do we do that? How do we do that if we're not just advertising it online to see it? And I suppose, politically, we're addressing letters and newsletters to write across to our residents. And maybe we should afford some of that, that, that little corner to see it to people. This is the opportunities. This is what we have available. We've obviously got the council newsletter as well. Maybe we can put something a bit more prominent in there just to, to help people understand that there is help out there because I have no doubt in my mind that there is residents panicking and panicking as, as digital technology comes further and further into the fore and, and, and they're unable to do anything. So on that, the, the Labour group will be supporting. Madam Mayor. Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, again, uh, uh, supportive of, of the intent uh, uh, with regards to the motion uh, uh, from the Lib Dems. Uh, I, I would make one point in relation to, to I know Councillor Fagan referenced the word uh, inter interrogated by, by, uh, with regards to, to some residents. And I do have a bit of concern about that because it's something that I personally don't recognise in relation to. to to my dealings with the service, so I would suggest if she's got any any particular examples of that, if she would mind, wouldn't mind forward them to me, and I'll investigate them, in that sense. But other than that, I think um, we need to always have th this service under review in relation to how we, we communicate with uh, our residents, um, depending on which service residents are accessing. Um, the number accessing online could be quite high in the 70s, some areas much lower, <laughs> and, and overall. Uh, I think the use of the telephone, the last statistics I saw, was still around about 40, 45% of, uh, of the total communication is, 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 th is through the telephone. Uh, and that is never going to go away. Um, and I know uh, Councillor Ty's reference family there, and I'll, I'll do exactly the same my, myself in relation to my own mum and dad. Um, that a mobile phone is an alien device, uh, never mind Wi-Fi and online, they just do not understand that. Uh, the phone is the lifeline, uh, and it's important to keep uh, that in place with regards to the council and how it communicates. But uh, Councillor Fagan did, did reference the fact that you know there's online, there's the phone, there's in person, there's by post, and in relation to payments, uh, one of the things I did when we when I first became portfolio was interest into uh, was to introduce the peer point service so people could use peer point services across the city again, to make it easier. But I think we also all share the same desire, and I think it's important that we always keep it under review to ensure that those people who are just not digitally minded, not interested in that, that they still can access council services. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Bond, do you wish to speak? Certainly, Madam Mayor, thank you. Um, I'm not going to go over all of the points, but I want to focus down on a couple of pieces of casework that sh show what the, what the council process is at the present time. And it does, um, does uh, pick up on uh, Councillor Stewart's point, because it was, it was around um, the ex-resident in Seaburn Dean, who was one of the two who've, who've uh, contacted me um, um, on this issue in the last few, few months. And he contacted me after his conversation with the council phone line. Um, 
and the, the conversation had gone like this. Basically, I previously told him when he'd been in contact with me that he could access a service over the phone, that it wasn't online only. Uh, the service he was trying to, um, uh, trying to access was the waste facility at, at uh, Pallion and to book a slot there. And the conversation went in the way that when he phoned up, to make the slot over the phone. This is a guy who hasn't got access to email, um, uh, doesn't do IT at all. You know, he, he has, a, has a mobile phone that's, that's, that's say, 20 years old. And um, the, the, the opening part of the conversation is that, and it was clearly from an algorithm, and this is not, not a criticism, of the, council, uh, of the council employee on the end of the line, okay? And he wished to make that point too. The, the conversation goes like this. All, all, access, all, all access to um, these services is, is online now, so you'll have to apply online. So, so that obviously the gentleman says, um, I don't have access to the internet. Then comes the line, have you a family member who can do that for you? Is there a neighbour or a friend who can go online for you to access that service? No. Well, then you can come down to City Hall and somebody on the front desk will help you access the service online at the front desk in, in City Hall. Now, I can, I can drill down on that because um, I did have contact following my email that said I wasn't happy with the situation because I th thought it showed, it showed their discrimination um, from, from a council officer who explained to me the service as it stood, and it is exactly as I explained there. So the gentleman had, had ex because this chap had listened to the phone call, and he went through all the various processes that they go to, um, um, and, and this, this lady, had, on the, the uh, council employee, had followed the algorithm. My point is, surely it would be a good idea for the council, for that person, as a first line to say, do you wish to have help to apply online, or do you just want me to make an appointment for the council facility? And that would, that would take it all away, and that would mean there's no... So it's all around point three on the motion. OK, thank you. Councillor Fagan, you have the right to reply. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just, to, just briefly, basically, just to, to follow up on um, Paul Stewart's point about the interrogation, that was, that was part of it. And I actually did some, after a resident rang me, I actually did a couple of test calls myself as well. And that I had good experiences and negative experiences. It has been something that's been raised um, with Mark Morley since then. So hopefully, you know, it's not something that's recurring all the time. Um, so it's not something I need to raise again. Um, unless I get further complaints from residents. Um, but I'm really pleased that it sounds like everyone's going to be supporting the motion. And it's, it's common sense, really, I think, that we just need to stop and think every time we move um, a step further in the digital world that we, we don't take a step back in the, you know, in the, in the world of those who are digitally isolated. Um, so we just need to have that step check in place to, to make sure that that does happen. Thank you. Can we take a vote on the motion by a show of hands? Electronic vote. So could the officer ring the division bell and to open the vote, please? The vote's open, members. And the vote will be closing now, members. Five votes in favour, unanimous.
Thank you. We'll now deal with the notice of motion which is titled Minimum Quality Guarantee for Road Repairs. Point of order, Madam Mayor. Under um, Rule uh, 13C, I wonder if it is in order to rearrange the um, order of the motion say that, so that we can next debate notice of motion rescind Ed Davies' knighthood. Um, it will be the last chance, the last chance Michael Hartnett gets to speak in this chamber, so it would be really Yay! good to uh, give him the chance to speak on that. Thank you. Are we all agreed? We will now deal with the notice of motion which is titled Rescind Ed Davies Knighthood. I call upon Councillor Michael Hartnack to read and move the motion. Ma Madam Mayor, do you want to wait for Councillor Mullen to arrive back into the chamber? Madam Mayor, thank you for allowing me to speak on this. Whilst we think that Ed Davey is a despicable character, we are... Councillor Hartnett. We are... Point of order, Madam Mayor. He has to read out the motion. You've been here for how many years, Michael? <laughs> Learn the rules. Ma Councillor Hartnett. Ma Madam, Madam Mayor, Can I, do you read have out the, the I do have the right... I do have the right under rules to withdraw this particular motion because there are some more important things to actually deal with within the chamber. Like Cole's, Cole's Kitchen at St Peter's needs to be discussed tonight uh, and we are withdrawing this motion on that basis. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, but I so wanted to speak on it, though. Can we please speak on it, please? <laughs> I'll second it, Paul. Leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor O'Brien. Stephen, can I have a minute? Thank you. Uh, just a little bit of clarification uh, from the city solicitor would be helpful to see whether at this stage a motion can be withdrawn like that because i've never i've never seen it in nearly 20 years uh and if it is we can then move on but i i think that since it's in the chamber we and it has been moved forward that we we have to deal with it thank you madam mayor madam mayor through you um the motion hasn't actually formally been moved um and the rules provide for a, a, a member can withdraw a motion which they've moved with the consent of the meeting, but in this case, it hasn't actually been moved. So I would suggest it, it can be withdrawn at this stage. So we will go back to deal with the notice of motion, which is titled Minimum Quality Guarantee for Road Repairs. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Peacock, will you read and move the motion, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, minimum quality guarantee for road repairs. Councillors of all parties are frustrated when roads are resurfaced to a poor standard and have to be resurfaced again within a short time frame. Council recognises this is a false economy and one which is resulting in a waste of taxpayers' money. Council therefore asks the Chief Executive to investigate a review of contract terms for road and pavement repairs to ensure that the Council receives a good quality service from subcontractors and to explore options for instituting a regular inspection regime so that officers are assured that a minimum quality standard has been met or otherwise take action when it has not. I so move this motion. 
Councillor Johnson, do you second the motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I second the motion and reserve the right to speak. Councillor Peacock, do you wish to speak to the motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. As stated in this motion, every councillor within this chamber has surely received reports from residents in their respective wards regarding damaged road surfaces. Whether that be the ever-present potholes, bumps or split tarmac, poorly patched repair work or loose chippings out of nowhere, sorry, appearing out of nowhere. When talking to residents about their concerns, the condition of the road surfaces around our city is indeed, is indeed one of the most common suggested topics. Generally, this is due to the obvious safety concerns for drivers. Occasionally, it is reflection on the aesthetics of poorly finished surfaces, but increasingly I'm asked about the costs involved in repairing and relaying damaged surfaces. I have no doubt that we will hear shortly from opposition councillors that the Tory government are to blame. They're to blame for everything, apparently. Something about cuts to funding and then the usual monotonous anti-Tory comments. However, this motion is not directed at political point scoring or highlighting the failings of this Labour-led council. The point is to look at improving quality, reducing costs and saving money which can be better directed elsewhere for the benefit of our residents. For context, the government allocated £1,835,000 for pothole repairs in Sunderland between 2022 and 2025 with £734,000 allocated for the financial year 2023 to 2024. I think we can all agree these are vast amounts of money and would it would be fair to imagine that this type of funding allocated to all of our roads should be smooth and free and fault free. Sorry I'm reading from a screen instead of a piece of paper as usual. I was going to ask hands up if the roads in your ward are smooth and fault free but I don't think anybody can put their hands up to that. So what can we do about this situation? Uh, we could wait until the general election later this year when I'm told Sir Keir Starmer's Labour will waltz into Downing Street, solving all of our problems, no doubt doubling council budgets, winding the clock back to 2007 when the world was perfect and fluffy for those with selective memories. However, just in case that particular fairy tale doesn't come true, I'd like to plan for an alternative. I think we need to look at the source of the problem first. Why is it that road surfaces don't seem to last very long? And it always seems that no sooner has a road been resurfaced, we are swerving to avoid potholes in it. My investigations have come up with several contributing factors. Traffic is a big issue, obviously. Larger vehicles on the roads, ties with greater surface area, and vehicles with more torque transfer to the road surface, and also increased volumes of traffic. <coughs> Our highways officers do a good job generally to keep traffic moving around the city's main roads, although driving more shoppers out of the city centre to outlying retail parks may be a stroke of genius. Even uh, Manessa getting behind that idea, I suppose. Another suggestion put forward was that the finished surface of the road is not correct. One ex-road worker who lives in my ward advised me there should be an additional top coat applied which is less permeable to moisture and therefore reduces the chances of potholes forming. He explained that the only reason for this not to be applied would be to reduce the installer's costs. I am by no means an expert in the world of tarmac, so I cannot confirm if this is correct, but it's surely worth investigating. And finally, we need to look at what we're asking for and paying for. It seems common business sense to carry out a cost analysis against paying for a higher quality surface at installation or paying for a substandard finish and then repairing faults as to when they occur. I was also amazed to discover that contractors are not currently asked to provide any warranty for road surfaces. Surely we should be asking installers to guarantee a freshly laid surface for a given period of time, and should it fail within that period, the cost of rectification would fall on them. This could potentially save the council thousands of pounds in premature repairs. So Madam Mayor, that is the motion put forward, a suggestion from the Sunderland Conservatives to look at how we can save the council unnecessary costs, improve the quality of our roads, and haul installers accountable for their work. I hope colleagues across the chamber will come together to support this motion and the Chief Executive in his review of contract terms. Thank you. Are there any amendments?
Does anyone wish to speak to the motion? Madam Mayor, we've received prior notice from councillors Gibson, Crosby, S. Johnston and Ty. Councillor Hartnack. Leader. Councillor Butler. Councillor Laws. Councillor Wilson. Councillor Wilson. Councillor Mordy. Councillor Truman. Councillor Blackburn. Councillor Hunter. Councillor Chapman. Councillor Chapman. And Councillor Jones. Councillor Jones. Councillor Gibson. Councillor Gibson. So, Madam Mayor, these speakers are Councillors Gibson, Crosby, S. Johnston, Ty, Hartnack, the Leader, but Councillor Butler, Laws, Wilson, Mordy, H. Truman, Blackburn, Hunter, Chapman, Jones and Councillor Peacock has the right of reply. Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. All councillors are annoyed and frustrated by poor standard road resurfacing and the need to frequently in, redo it in a short time frame. A waste of council taxpayers' money which could be better spent elsewhere. We've no objection to a review of contract terms, regular inspection regimes, higher quality standards, etc., backed by a meaningful penalty clause. However, this motion is against a massive backlog of repairs, which isn't mentioned. A background to which the mover of the motion's party bears some responsibility. According to the Local Government Association, Spending on local road repairs has been reduced by more than nearly all other members of the Organisation of Economic Cooperation and Development over 20 years. The LGA stressed the need for greater and more consistent funding to get investment up to other countries' standards. They recommend that the government spends, say, the government devolves 2p from the fuel tax to local councils to enable them to um, improve local roads. The, cost, the lower cost of uh, potto repairs and less air pollution, excellent economic and, and ecological sense. Bringing um, local roads up to standard, boost the economy, jobs and investment, good sound Keynesian economics. According to the OECD, the UK spent four billion pounds on local road maintenance in 2006. By 2019, it was down to two billion. In reality, a more than 50% cut, because in real terms, there's inflation take into account. The latest estimate for the repair backlog is 14 billion pounds. Without extra funding, it takes 11 years to deal with. The extra money in the budget comes nowhere near filling the gap, even though it is uh, welcome. The International Forum of Road Infrastructure and Maintenance confirms these figures. Taking 2006 as a base year and giving it a figure of 100%, by 2019, our expenditure was down to 51% of the 2006 figure. Compare it with New Zealand, up to 178. America, 152. Sweden, 141. It's not surprising that our infrastructure simply doesn't stand comparison. Plan insurance brokers, hardly a bunch of militant lefties, came up with exactly the same figure, £14 billion. Pounds. In 21-22, the backlog uh, the fire of that fiscal year, 1.7 million potholes are filled in. By 22-23, only 1.4 million potholes. Compensation paid out by insurers over that year went up by 30%. Claims rose 
from 8.9 million to 11.6 million. In its opinion, the 14 billion pound figure is probably an underestimate. Although supportive of the motion, we need to be aware of the tr where the true source of the problem lies, lack of funding. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Crosby. Someone's speaking. Uh, could Paul, could you turn off your microphone? Turn there for a minute. Oh. It's not working, so I'll use this one. Uh. I know, damn it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today I want to shed light on a silent menace that has been wreaking havoc on our vehicles, on my vehicle. Uh, the notorious unrepaired pothole. These sneaky creators are not just innocent dents in the road, they're car assassins in disguise. Picture this. <laughs> You're cruising down the road, minding your own business, when suddenly, bam, your car hits a pothole and you feel it in your bones. What you might not realise is that your poor vehicle is taking the brunt of the impact. Potholes aren't just annoying, they're car kryptonite. The jolt from hitting one can wreak havoc on your suspension system, turning your smooth ride into a bumpy roller coaster. Your tyres, once happily gripping the road, now bear the scars of battle, and not the kind that adds character. <laughs> I had to have four new tyres after driving around Thorny Close for a year. <laughs> Alignment issues become the new normal as potholes mischievously throw your wheels out of balance. It's like they have a personal vendetta against your steering, turning every drive into a wrestling match for control. And let's not forget about the undercarriage, the unsung hero of your vehicle's well-being. Potholes turn it into a crash test dummy, enduring blows that can lead to costly repairs and aching wallets. Last month, I had to take my car for repairs after being ambushed by a pothole on Brockenhurst Drive in Hastings Hill, which broke loose part of my exhaust system. We ask for them to be repaired, but sometimes they're back within months, not least because of the extreme heat and excess rain in the last couple of years. But in all seriousness, folks, our roads and pavements deserve better. We need better, well-inspected repairs, filled in well enough that we have no more complaints after only a few months. Not a crash course in dealing with craters and holes. Let's pave the way to smoother journeys and safer commutes. At the moment, our road repairers could do a lot better. Thank you. Yay! Well done. Leader. Councillor Crosby, I'm, I'm very, very impressed. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for putting a smile on everybody's faces. Even the Conservative councillors <laughs> were grimacing through the pain there. Look, I have to say, Counts uh, the Tory government is to blame. That's just the truth of it. 40, 14 years of underinvesting in the public sector. You know, 14 years of not worrying about how we all get to work and take the kids to the beach down the line. Because the roads 14 years ago were in a much better condition than they are now. And we're all having to deal with it. I have no problem having the council look at how we monitor works, none at all. Right? I'm going to ask you how we're going to do it, though, given that we've got rid of 3,000 staff over the last 14 years, and we might need a few more staff. And, uh, yeah, so, do you remember Rishi? Yeah. Sta standing outside number 10, stating that he, he was, his commitment to integrity, professionalism, and accountability. Well, I, I genuinely think we're all going to hold the Tories accountable 
for this because this is a problem entirely of their making. And it's not me saying that. It's the many Conservative councils down south who have much bigger pothole worries than Sunderland. Where, I've got to be honest, is the, is the Tory transport plan? Their industrial plan? Their economic plan? Any, any plan? They've not had one for the whole time they've been in government other than to transfer wealth from the poorest sections of society to the wealthiest sections in society. Because in that 14 years, all we've done is, is doubled the number of millionaires, increased the wealth of billionaires, and people are suffering to their bones. Thanks for taking that from me, Councillor Crosby. Because they're feeling it through, are you better off now than you were in 2010? Point of order, Mayor. Councillor Peacock. Um, under Rule 14.5, Madam Mayor, Speeches must be directed to the question in a discussion. Why are we talking about the government? <laughs> nothing in that, <laughs> nothing in that asks you, <laughs> Councillor Miller, to refer to the history of the government. This is about Sunderland Council. Sorry, can we, can we just listen to Councillor Peacock, please? Thank you. This is about trying to save money for Sunderland Council. It's not critical of the council. This is about trying to save money so we can repair the roads for our residents in Sunderland. I'm not talking about £14 billion elsewhere. I'm not talking about the last 14 years of government. I'm talking about doing something for our residents. Can we keep to the point, please? This motion was put back because we overran last meeting and we can't address any of the other motions because we're going to overrun this time. Stop talking about the government. Talk about Sunderland Council. All right, leader. So can we stick to Sunderland, please? Uh, I absolutely am, Madam Mayor, but I have fundamentally disagree with Councillor Peacock's view. I'm talking about the context to which this notice of motion applies. The reason we have poor standards in roads is because of Tory decisions to cut funding over 14 years. And there's just no, there's no getting away from it. And that actually is a direct attack on the council because the context of that is to say the council isn't doing a good job of keeping our roads in good repair because we don't have enough people to keep an eye on the contractors. Well, we don't have enough people to keep an eye on the contractors because you lot have cut over 300 million from the budget since what we had in 2010. <laughs> anyway, back to being relaxed, Councillor Miller. All right. All we've had, and I, I just wish you'd get this, our pound for buying and doing things is less now than it was because of government issues around trussonomics. That's the biggie, right? Crashing the economy, eh, kamikaze quarteting, uh, all of that. And that fiscal event, as the Conservatives like to make, it's a fiscal event. It wasn't just blatant madness on their part. Uh, has damaged our national economy and damaged our spending value. And that is why we agree with the tone of this, Councillor Peacock. We're, we weren't not going to stand against it. We're not going to amend it. But you have to accept that the reason the council does less on this is because it has less to do on this. And that is entirely appropriate for me or any other councillor in this chamber to raise those points because it fundamentally points at complete mismanagement of the national economy by your party, which has led to poor Councillor Crosby breaking her tyre in a pothole. And with that, Madam Mayor, I'll sit down. Thank you. Councillor Butler. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the leader has said a lot in which I wanted to say as well, but... Um, I think Councillor Peacock brought this motion um, and there's, there's some good, good things in there. Uh, and I do agree with some of that in that we do need to monitor the pothole issue. However, what I will say is that for all of those councillors that were at a North Area Committee meeting at St Peter's Church, and I can't remember the date, um, we met with one of the officers to ask 
very similar questions. Uh, he presented us with some stats uh, and statistics, of course. But what I will say, Madam Mayor, is don't quote me on these because they're just off the cuff. Um, at the current levels of funding from the Tory government, we would require £146 million to bring the city of Sunderland's roads up to standard. Now, that's not going to happen in a month of Sunders, as my grandmother would say. It's just not going to happen. So therefore, as a resident of Sunderland with the current level of funding, you can expect your road to be relayed, not every 50 years, not even every 100 years, but every 150 years. And that's not good enough for the residents of Sunderland. Of course, we can fix potholes here and there, but quite frankly, it is a waste of taxpayers' money. If only we had the right amount of funding in the local government, could we do something about the long-term implications of the poor road repairs? Um, what I will say is that, hopefully there's no point of orders here, um, saving 2p from national insurance contributions equals around a cup of coffee a week. I tell the Tory government that can keep that, that can pour it into a pot, and that can fix our roads and fund local government correctly after 14 years of cuts to Sunderland City Council. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm now going to go to Councillor Johnston. I think that it has been debated fully on both sides. There's no amendments. So, sorry? <laughs> so now we'll go to Councillor Johnson, please. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, on my copy of the agenda, I've got Michael Dixon as the seconder for this motion. And yet, on the board up there, we have Sam Johnson. Are we debating a proper constituted notice of motion? Thank you. Thank you. I've been advised that it's fine. Everyone, anyone can second it. So now we will go to Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll start by getting my small violins out for the Labour group and just remind them that the reasons for cuts in local government funding is because Labour in 2010 left us with no money. Yes, exactly. So, once again, Labour expects to be insulated from the consequences of their own failure to rule. Now, if the understanding is that money is tight in this council, we have to accept the current approach to road resurfacing isn't working. You're spending money to do repairs that aren't fixing the problem, so you spend more and more money on the same problems. That is rather frustrating. So, we have two options. Either we accept the current state of the roads, and Councillor Miller hires them out to NASA to prepare the astronauts for the lunar surface, or we actually take a new approach that allows us to repair more with the money we have, which is what Councillor Peacock has put forward. Councillor Butler is right. The current time frame to resurface a street in the city, I think, is actually even higher. It's about 168 years, I think, is the exact number. That is, frankly, disgraceful and something we have to tackle. Now, everyone has talked about roads. I intend to Madam talk Mayor, about... Madam Mayor, point of order, please. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, the figure that the Tory councillor has just quoted isn't necessarily accurate because every year, in fact, every week, we're taking on new roads from new developments, which will extend that period. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That was an utterly irrelevant intervention, but it is what it is. So, I'll move on to the second issue, which I think has been broadly overlooked in this debate, 
And for the second meeting running, I'm playing the role of Sunderland's leading James Doyle Tribute Act, our beloved former deputy leader. Now, despite being a tribute act, I'll briefly say, for council readers watching the stream, I'm not after your job, and for the Labour group as well, who we apparently announced and wanted leadership challenges to now, I'm not after anyone. So, to move on now to talk about the work of Create Streets. Create Streets is a great, great institution who talks a lot about how we should look after our public role. And Create Streets, one of their big campaigns at the minute, is about street scarring and the damages to our pavements done rather than the roads. So if we look actually beyond the roads a second into the pavements, we look in places like Roker, but across the city, with the damage done to pavements by utility works. You see it in other areas of the public realm as well, where very nice, very well laid out pavements and areas are undertaking repairs of a substandard quality that diminishes the visual appeal of them. Our residents want to be proud of their city, and when we have public realms that are ugly, look like patchwork quilts, we won't do that. We need to change our approach to the pavements as well as the road to give people pride in the local community. I will concede to one point the Labour group has made. I think central government does have a role to play in this. The legislation, especially around street scarring, is rather vague at the minute. But despite being vague, the council is not powerless, and that is why Councillor Peacock's motion is so vital. By setting clear expectations for our standards, our expectations, we'll get a long way towards fixing utterly avoidable problems. And that is why it is so vital we support this motion tonight. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Point of order, Madam Mayor. Councillor Tai. Yeah, thanks for that. And, and I was wanting to speak. I had some very interesting things to discuss. I did give prior notification that I think in the future we should we should take the questions or, or, or let those speak. That's made prior notification, otherwise it just makes a mockery of we're making prior notification. But in fairness, under, um, under the constitution, I, I, I suggest under 14.22 that the question now be put. Councillor Peacock. Um, yeah. Just uh, briefly, just to pick up on a couple of points, if I may, Madam Mayor, before we put the question. Um, Councillor Gibson, as always, has done a, a lot of research, um, came up with some great figures. Unfortunately, didn't research the actual motion to see that it was about Sunderland and not about the rest of the country or the world. Um, but I appreciate the, the information you came up with. Councillor Crosby, um, an excellent speech. I, again, we were all smiling on this side as well. Um, Car Assassins in Disguise, I think, would make a great band name and should surely be fronted by our colleague James Doyle, who was a, a proponent for getting rid of cars. Um, Councillor Miller, uh, as predicted, talked about national politics rather than local politics, but I wish I'd put a pound on that. And Councillor Butler, um, again, fantastic st uh, statistics. Um, very interesting, but I think you, you missed the point. It was about trying to reduce costs in our council so we can address these problems, rather than trying to, to blame anybody else for... Thank you. Uh, that's it, uh, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Can we take a vote on the motion? And can we... Oh, that's very simple. Right, we've now come to four minutes past seven. So I'd like to say thank you very much. And that concludes the meeting.